Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 268. With us uh, is not our guest co-host yet. Um, he just came in. He just came in. Just, okay, there he is. Yeah. Mark will be joining us briefly. Da -da -da. Mark is in the building. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Okay. With us in the meanwhile is Mr. Edward St. with Flip2, Mr. Dean Schmidt with uh, Metasearch Marketing Base Camp Metasearch. Hey, Mark. How are you, sir? Hi, Sorry, I am one minute late. A little technical. Oh, oh hell hath to pay. Yes, it's it was. We were sitting there going, well, we can do a soft shoe if we need to. But <laughs> <laughs> also with us is Mr. Ben Hanley from 36. Uh, Mark, let me make introductions real quick. You already know Ed. Yeah. Dean Schmidt with Meta Search yeah. Marketing and Ben Henley with uh, 36 uh, Agency. North uh, New Guinea, I think you're located, correct? <laughs> uh, no. Oh, no, I, I'm not. If, no, if he's, in, he's, he's in South Africa. So, no. Oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> no, we make fun of Ben on a regular basis, Mark, because he is from Northern England. Yeah, he, he can't tell, but he might have a slight accent, just not too sure. I, you think it's I have zero <laughs> accent whatsoever. Mike, Mark, accent this before. show is... A wash, a wash with casual racism. Um, <laughs> it really is. If I put on a posher accent, maybe they'll accept me. Just well, remember, well, Lauren, well, we used well, to own your country, so that's that's true. That's true. Yeah, we, have, we wish to take it back sometime. Um, <laughs> no, 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 keep it, keep it. <laughs> keep it. So, um, so, so we don't scare Mark away. I invited Mark on the uh, on the show. Uh, I I had the pleasure of being introduced to to Mark. Uh, by our friends at Navis. And uh, Mark and I kind of got to talking about the interesting things he does uh, with his agency. And that's when I uncovered um, that he was behind uh, Book Now, Stay Later, the uh, hotel bond program. And I was like, whoa, that's really mm -hmm. cool. We've talked about that. And so I thought it would be really neat uh, to, you know, follow our own rules and give Mark the first 30 minutes uh, where Mark can tell us about him and about, you know, I really want to hear more about what inspired the book now stay later and, and, you know, ask you a lot of questions about that. So, uh, you know, with that, so Mark doesn't have to develop sharp elbows. Uh, Mark, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Thanks, uh, the, the floor is yours, my friend. All right. Awesome. I'm going to go on some random tangents. Uh, I look forward to that. Uh, we never do that. Really weird things for about 30 minutes. No, thank you all so much for having me on on, uh, on the show. Um, I want to talk to you guys about uh, Buy Now, Stay Later. Uh, but before I get into that, I, I do want to say that Buy Now, Stay Later was a collaborative effort between my agency and Rachel Harrison Communications. Uh, shout out to Rachel Harrison. So um, I want to make it very clear that this was by no means a one agency show, although we did, uh, uh, we are responsible for a large part of it. Um, so I guess I'll start with a quick introduction about me and my agency, if uh, you know, uh, some of you aren't familiar with us. So um, I'm one of the co-founders of Elemental. We're a marketing and communications agency that specializes in mostly tourism, travel, and hospitality. Uh, so we work with tourism boards around the world, including uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is an intergovernmental organization that covers 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, we represent the Kingdom of Thailand for tourism in Canada, the US, Mexico, and all of Latin America. Uh, and we uh, we represent a number of small islands in, in the British Virgin Islands. So um, a lot of DMO work, and, and we can talk about that later as well, because obviously tourism is, uh, is related to hospitality, and it's been a very interesting sector to be working with in the last year. Um, and on the hotel side, we work uh, largely with independent hotels uh, around the, the US. Um, in large metropolitan areas like New York and Chicago, but also in some smaller suburban areas as well. So uh, no big brands, all, all independent. Um, and then also for us, hospitality is anywhere where there's a host and a guest. So the, the foundation of the agency was actually largely in restaurants. So we worked with, and we continue to work with independent restaurants around the country, but also um, restaurant brands. So uh, on the independent side, if you're familiar with New York, you'll know places like Katz's Deli and, and Sylvia's up in Harlem. So they're, they're clients wow. of ours. And then uh, on the branded side, uh, the Halal Guys is a long-term client of ours, uh, but also international franchises like Bonchon Fried Chicken. If uh, if you've ever had some late night drunken Korean fried chicken, you'll know Bonchon. No, <laughs> but I want some now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's, that's kind of uh, our, our focus. And interspersed in there, we've got a few kind of adjacent fun 
lifestyle and spirits clients. So we work with Stoli for for many years. We work with a handful of international beverage brands. Hey, hey, Tristan. Oh, Tristan. He's with Ben. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Yeah, Not he's, with he's Ben. With ben. Yeah, Not with Ben. ben. In a biblical sense, I'm, I'm I'm loving all of these Commonwealth accents. You know, we just need one more, and we'll have the. Uh, the <laughs> well, where's Stewart? Well, Stewart, Stewart. 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 He tells yeah, nothing. Stewart, wrong. you're in here somewhere. Come on, you're from somewhere. Australia. Like yeah. Don't be shy, Stewart. <laughs> Don't be shy. Nice. Um, cool, cool. Very nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet so, you. Too. Uh, yeah, uh, th those are the sectors that we cover, and in terms of what we do, really, it's it's integrated marketing. Uh, as many different channels, mostly digital, that we can touch. So we do the creative side of things. We uh, develop the brand. We'll build the assets like the websites and apps. And then we run the marketing on social media, paid ads. Um, where things get interesting is we also try to connect that through to experiential, to influencer work, to PR, so that we can have uh, as many different touch points and opportunities to tell the stories for our clients as possible. That's the kind of work that we really love to do. I mean, we will, we do occasionally do the one-off kind of build a website or run a PPC campaign, uh, but that's not what gets my team uh, uh, up and firing in the morning. Uh, so the team's kind of spread out between four offices. We've got uh, New York, Dallas, which is where I'm, I'm based. Our development team is based in Manila, uh, and then we have a creative team based in Sao Paulo. Um, so for for a company with four offices, we don't really have that many people. We're still pretty small. It's 20, 20 full time. Um, and uh, fortunately, with everything that's been going on, we've been able to retain everyone, which has been nice. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, partially due to our careful planning and quick responses, and a large part, just pure luck. Uh, pure luck. And <laughs> we'll, we'll, I always we'll... say it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> yeah, that's lucky, the, unlucky. The I'm title just, of my book. <laughs> I, I, I fully agree with that. I mean, there's there's a lot of this. Most of this we could nobody could have planned for. And if you think about the the range of um, sectors that we cover, I don't think you could have picked a worse basket of sectors to focus on at this particular time, because our clients just disappeared off the map. Some of them closed. Uh, a lot of them shut down and, and, and are only now just starting to reopen. So obviously mm -hmm. we're faced with a dilemma where, um, and you know, you guys know this, the hotels need marketing services more than ever, but they don't have the money to pay for it. So then what do you do? Um, and what we ended up doing uh, for, for a lot of our clients was essentially providing the same level of coverage, if not more, and just significantly cutting our fees or offering pro bono services. Because at the end of the day, this is what we love to do, but we also want to have clients on the other side of this. Right. Um, and at the same time, not go under as a business. So it's it's, it's a delicate balance there. And our, our only saving grace, uh, which I mentioned before, was um, the tourism work that we do. Because we, uh, you know, the, as, as annoying as uh, bureaucratic government clients can be, they pay on time and they have to pay because it's illegal for them not to pay. So we had um, our our government contracts with our tourism clients to, to fall back on. And then the volume of work with them increased significantly because they're they're also looking at this at a longer time horizon than maybe, you know, private businesses. Right. Like uh, uh, they're, they're not so much concerned about immediate cash flow coming in and uh, and keeping things afloat, but that rather they're looking at well, what does recovery look like in 24 months, 36 mm -hmm. months? You know, how do I stay top of mind so that people still remember that Thailand is a wonderful place to go visit? Uh, and and with all that pent up demand, when it's time to pull the trigger, you know, that they know that they you, there are, you know, um, outdoor destinations, but also luxury, but also all these different things. So uh, a lot of our, our tourism clients actually doubled the, the amount of uh, work that, that they've been asking us to do. Which has been fantastic, and we've and we've been able to do some interesting things out of that. Um, but that kind of a long introduction, getting getting to buy now stay later. So uh, buy now stay later was an initiative that we had launched with with Rachel Harrison Communications, and the genesis of it was really just trying to figure out well, if we can't do the marketing that we normally do for hotels at this time, what can we be doing to help them out that doesn't cost them any money, that is very simple for people to understand. And that's really the, the premise behind Buy Now, Stay Later, where uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's a website where 
hotels can come in and list uh, their offering and offer um, essentially what we've called a hotel bond, where consumers can come and purchase a hotel stay or a hundred dollars worth of, of hotel stay. And if they wait 60 days for the bond to mature, then that stay is worth an equivalent of $150. Right? So it, it achieves a few different purposes. One, it gives um, cash flow, immediate cash flow to the hotel. Um, but it also allows consumers to make purchasing decisions right off the bat, right? So, uh, which is not, not available, like, right, at, especially at the beginning of the, um, when, when COVID hit, transactions weren't available to people. So people could essentially put this in the bank, get some extra value for later on. Uh, and so we built this website. We, uh, we, we spread the word through, through our own channels and the response was enormous. I mean, almost immediately we had uh, within the first few weeks, close to 500 hotels from around the world hmm. just asked to be part of this. And r running the gamut from all different kind of class, uh, star classes, all different uh, uh, categories. Um, and so then this this thing kind of took a, a life on its own. We started getting picked up on, on, on media and we had to um, make some adjustments, adjustments to the website uh, to account for the increased volume. Um, but it's been great. And I, I don't have the latest numbers off the top of my head, but we've had the, the number of inquiries for uh, bond purchases is in the tens of thousands. Um, and we've had hotels, which fortunately, I'm really happy about this, have had to pull their listing from the site because they, <laughs> they're tired of getting um, uh, inquiries. Now, that, that's obviously not the, that's not everyone. And, and uh, this, this I, I don't want to make this seem that like this has made hotels rich across the board, but it has been something that has helped. And um, uh, we set this up as, as a complete pro bono exercise. Um, we're not handling any of the transactions. Everything is done at the hotel level. We're not taking any kind of commissions. It's purely just kind of lead generation for them. Um, so, and, and uh, we had thought that this would probably wind up, wind down around um, August, but we keep on getting inquiries for people to be part of it. So, I mean, that's not necessarily a great sign for where we are as as an industry, but uh, this there seems to be still demand for this. And uh, one of one of the pleasant offshoots of this was uh, Thailand. Our client Thailand had actually asked us to build a uh, a separate subsite specifically for Thai resorts and and, and Thai hotels, so that they could uh, drive some traffic um, specifically to help their own economy. So, so that's. Uh, that's the 10 minute overview of, of buy now, stay later and us. Hopefully that so, all makes sense. So, I mean, no one here likes the idea that you've done right by your clients because no one no. on the show does that. Um, no. So you don't fit in at all. No, it's, no, it's actually no. funny. Um, it's why I invited you um, because <laughs> we've had many episodes where we've talked about, you know, kind of what you need to do to be a real part of the hospitality community. Um, now is not the time to, you know, try and rake people over the coal. It's the time to, you know, put up your sleeves and, and help everyone. And, uh, you know, I think it's great that you, that you did this. And, uh, the, the bond program was just really clever. Um, you know, that, that even that whole idea of a bond, like to, to create a model that wouldn't require, people to go, well, I don't understand what's a bond program. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what a bond is, right? Um, and and when I saw the scale um, of how many hotels uh, yeah. took advantage of it, like it's impressive you guys scaled it that fast. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned you had to do some reworking because of how picked up it got. I mean, really, what were you thinking that it was going to be? So initially, I mean, we had our own network of hotels that we work with or that we've previously worked with. So. In the beginning, we thought it was just going to be that we were going to be in, you know, 20, 30, maybe get up to 50 and, and we could get some uh, get some traction around that. And also we knew that this wasn't um, we didn't we knew that we weren't the only people who, who came up with this idea. There were other sort of concepts that were quite similar to this as well. But we wanted to set it up in a way where it had the lowest transaction cost possible for any kind of participant. So we didn't want to layer in any kind of. Let's, uh, for example, an actual transaction on the site, because then we'd have to deal with all of the, you know, the whole ecosystem of hotel tech and trying to connect with this person's, you know, booking engine and that sort of thing. Um, and that would necessarily limit the hotel's ability to, to participate. Uh, so um, 
you know, we 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 saw other um, you know hotel groups, and there were there were some other agencies that launched similar sort of concepts, but they had you know you could actually book the stay there and then, um, but then you know then you could only include a handful of hotels at a time. So uh, mm -hmm. we that was the the decision that we made, and when we started getting you know into the hundreds of applications, uh, we realized one well we have to reformat the website so that people can actually find the hotels now because we ended up with like people ended up having to scroll for like a minute and a half to get to a hotel <laughs> we to add add filters and you know add geography and that sort of thing uh but also just on the back end being able to handle that volume of of inquiries um and just answering the questions like you know oh can can i offer additional things on top of the hundred dollars 150 dollars and so on and so forth just answering those questions we had to figure out a way to do that that wouldn't overtax us because in the meantime we're still trying to stay afloat as an agency sure uh, but uh we we were able to figure out more more or less like simplified ways there and again i i, I want to make sure mention rachel as well because her team had handled a lot of those inquiries and uh um uh, was we're still going here so i'm glad that it's been of, of benefit and you know the, the emails that we've gotten from uh from various hotels and if you go onto the website, you can see some fairly well-known names. But also, mm -hmm. you, you know, you scroll through, and and some of the hotels that have expressed their their um, gratitude for what what they've been out, been able to get out of it, you know, the you know tiny little Wyndhams in 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 small towns around, and that's been fantastic. When you wake up to an email like that, you know, it just sets you on the right path for the rest of the day, uh, and mm -hmm. it keeps you going for for all the other horrible news that you're going to get during the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Start here, and you can yeah. go down. Yeah, at least you're down, but at least you're gliding in. But I, I have two questions for this. And first off, kudos for you because you cut through the clutter. You, you, rather than trying to figure out how to monetize it and how to integrate it, and where can I get my margins and my percentages, and you know, you just said, "Look, here's something that can help." Boom, we'll build it. You guys use it. It goes directly to you. So absolutely phenomenal that that that, that you put it that way. What did you ever consider the idea of, of of extending the timelines where it would mature longer for a higher value, given that there might be still some delays, uh, like saying, "Hey, look, if you wait six months, it's going to be a little bit different." It's still with a cap. I mean, you obviously don't want the hotels to give away the farm eventually, but right. just to, you know, for those like for instance, Thailand. By the way, I, I got to remind you of a friend of ours that's in Thailand, Isaac. And Gertzig, he and I know I never say his last name correctly, Isaac, but he is, you could say just his first name. And I say his first name, great. His last name, I can't get for yeah. heck. He's actually uh, called, Isaac, he's actually called Isaac Dave, though. That's the problem. Yeah. He's, called, he's called Dave. <laughs> he just got his total name wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, sorry, Mark. I know you speak three languages. I can follow up one language, just so you know. I'm, that's my that's my skill set is I come up with new words and say that's bad a, names. That's a pretty amazing <laughs> skill, <huh? laughs> It's a, it's a skill I have. I don't know. It's a gift. Um, but Isaac is phenomenal in country. Right now, he's not doing much of anything. And I, I would love to find him something to do. So if you ever need somebody in Thailand, let me know. But I do want to make sure you connect yeah, with this. Yeah, he's he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, just because of economies, he's he's there with his family. And probably end Atlanta when the school gets out for his kids, I think, at the end of the year, he's leaving. But anyway, so the idea of being able to, to do this and extend it. But also, do you guys see this turning into something else in time? Do you see this? Shifting. I mean, you have this amazing amount of funnel that you have going on. Is there something else you're thinking you might try to? Uh, what's in the pipe? I guess roadmap wise for it. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll answer the first part um, first. So we we spent a lot of time thinking about what the different kind of permutations of this could be, and and at the end, what we arrived at was we wanted to make essentially like the minimal viable configuration that as many hotels could use as possible, right? Uh, because the you know. What would make sense for one property might not make sense for another one, and so you could extend the timelines of different values, so on and so forth. And we say very clearly uh, when um, uh, when the hotels sign up is that you know you can you can uh, adjust this however you like. If you want to offer this in different increments and in different time periods or add on additional bells and whistles, that's entirely up to you, and, and we highly encourage you because there is going to need some some customization will need to happen. Um, but we our rationale was that we wanted to have something that was as easy to understand as possible and leave it at that. And that would be the first draw. And I think um, the we've received some feedback uh, when people have, you know, used buy now, stay versus other websites that offer similar sorts of offerings. And 
the feedback has always been it's just easier to understand what's going on here. I don't need to read into the fine print, um, and uh, and you know it reduces that that transaction cost. So um, definitely where we've explored other configurations, but we've mostly left that up to the to the hotels themselves to to offer afterwards. And then as as far as the next steps for this, we're working on a few different things. Um, and, and largely that's contingent on where where we are going as an industry because you still have, I mean, there's there's what we want, what we plan to do. And then three months from now, we'll see where we actually are. Um, and, uh, but we do have a few different ideas from this and, and it's been, it's been great seeing the community that's, that's uh, emerged out of this, right? And, and I think that's been a recurring theme in, in a lot of conversations that I've had recently is that uh, the, the community has really come out and in in more prosperous times you know uh it's it's easier just to stay in your own bubble and and focus on your thing and and see everyone as a potential competitor for the margins of business but i, I think by and large we've all realized that as an industry we all have to band together in order to recover but also that mm -hmm. the pie itself is is much less or is much bigger or, or at the very least much more shareable than we thought it was before. Yes. Um, and, and the pie is now three dimensional. And, and so where we were thinking of just my slice before now together, we can get all of these different elements. And so, um, some would say the pie is infinite. The pie <laughs> is infinite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 3.14268392, whatever. <laughs> That's going to be the, uh, the title of your next book, The Infinite The Pie, pie. is Infinite. The Pie, the pie is Infinite. Is infinite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you haven't been able to see this because you're new here, but in the chat we did put a uh, link to buy now stay later. But then oh, cool. Ben had to rightfully claim stake that he was the first one to discover this in our group five months ago. Thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, you know, so really, I'll, I'll be yeah, I'll be entirely honest. Um, I, I wasn't supposed to show up to this call to this webinar. I was supposed to do it next week's, but when I heard you were coming and that you were part of this. Yeah, I, I said, uh, well, I had a polite discussion with my wife about trading chores and responsibilities for the time to be here because it's a little bit later in England here. When I first heard about this, and it was from um, a lad called Javier Moreno at uh, Pegasus, who's an account manager, I just thought this is brilliant. Bear in mind, I, I'd come out of a quite a um, quite a rigid, uh, structured um, department, and to come out into the world of hospitality and see everyone just banding together to try and keep everyone's heads above water was amazing. I fanboyed in a massive way. I reached out to both the founders. I think it was Lion and Lamb Communications, Rachel and the, yep. the, the lady whose name I forget, and just sent them this long email. Why well, do you think about this? This is great. It's fantastic. Actually, you should go on a show. I know a guy called Lauren. You should go on a Friday. And it was brilliant. And, and you see everyone you speak to, Everyone you speak to has a different opinion about this, or, or or see something else, something new in it. Like, oh, we could mature the bonds, and they could be worth longer. Or why don't we trade the bonds? Or mm -hmm. what happens if the hotels go under? Or mm -hmm. da, da 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 da. And I, my inbox, I got some quite difficult questions actually. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if if I go under, are you, is there an insurance policy? Well, not from me. No, I, I just, I just, it's not, it's not my platform, dude. Um, <laughs> but what a great question and. It just you said it earlier on. Now isn't the time to try and fleece people. Now isn't the tra time to try and sever the last thread of the of the industry. Now is the time to chase relationships over revenue. Absolutely, and, and, and it's something that I can speak at for everybody. You know, on the in the Friday Club, that that's that's what that's what this this pandemic and this this emergency is unearthed in the industry. The fact that. Not, it's not just the relationships with your clients, it's relationships with vendors, other vendors that would have been your competitors uh, that you would have been fighting for the same business for and that you, you maybe wouldn't have spoken so openly with about. And everyone's realized we're all in sort of this really shitty situation. Yep. We, you know, all the boats. What's, what's the phrase, Lauren? The tide rises all boats? Yep. Yes, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this is a really great example of it. I think it's a brilliant scheme. Mm -hmm. I really yep. do. And I'm uh, mentioning it to anyone that will listen over in Europe. Um, to yeah, try there's nobody on the UK on this site. We'll have to rectify that, Ben. Yeah. We'll have to rectify that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think we, I think we know why. Uh, I think it's, I think there's, a dist um, we're playing whack-a-mole over here. 
at the moment in, in local <laughs> lockdowns. It's like, uh, you can have a lockdown and now you can have a lockdown. You... So a lot of the hotels are, are, are struggling a little bit more over here than they were a couple of months ago. But, very, you know, you definitely got to uh, to slightly overweight old male cheerleaders over here in the UK. <laughs> I'll, take I'll take it. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you for the kind words. And again, I, I want to say, like, Ra Rachel and her team were equally part of this. And, and um, I, I'm fully with you on this in terms of the focus of, of, uh, of where we should be right now in the industry. Relationships is, at the end of the day, it's, it's all we have in this industry because, and this was kind of like, a, it was a conversation I was having earlier this week with, with Navis. Um, we, we had a very long uninterrupted period of growth and, uh, and joy. And, and whenever that happens, obviously, you know, I, I, I worked in, I was an investment banker before, uh, before I was a marketer. And you know we, we've seen what happens when uh, when things go too well for, for too long, things go horribly bad afterwards. Um, and so now, when when shit hit the fan, essentially, you you got to find out who your friends were, but also mm -hmm. you got to discover who your allies were, where you didn't think they were before, and mm -hmm. um, that was tremendously encouraging. And uh, just speaking for myself and for, for, for our agency, we have done more business development and partnerships in the last six months than we had in the previous you know, few years. Uh, yep. And partially that was up more active and saying, like, look, this is what we need to do now. But it, it was equally other people reaching out to us and saying, hey, let's let's have a discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the, the, the joys I think we've all shared is when we were talking to our clients, when all this was spiraling downward, and they're like, hey, they're, they were making the call or they were talking to you or you reached out to them and they thought they were going to have to tell you how they had to sever the relationship. And you're like, dude, this is the chance to pull the car off the racetrack and rip the engine out. Let's get some stuff done while we got less word to worry about. And they're like, well, we can't pay you. We weren't talking about getting paid. We're talking about getting the stuff done. Mm -hmm. and, and just that that really pleasant pause at the other end going, really? <laughs> you know, like the, that, that realization of like, wow. It, yeah. The, you know this is going to come around, not because they're going to just throw tons of money at you. You just know that they trust you more now than they did before thinking it was based on a check that they sent you, that they realized that you were really there to help them and that they really appreciate that you were still there to help them, even though they weren't in the same position they were before. So, mm -hmm. I think the, um, the, the role of advisor and of partner has been highlighted enormously in this time period. So whereas previously, uh, a lot of the conversations with clients would have focused on, all right, these are the things that we do for you on a daily basis. We're executing this, et cetera, et cetera. And then the advisory part may have been less or more important, but we have really become uh, a nexus of information for, for our clients because especially in the beginning periods of, of COVID, everything was changing every single day and no one person or one group could have access to all the information. So we were, because naturally, because we were having conversations with people all over the country and all over the world, dealing with their separate issues, we were able to relay things from one corner to mm -hmm. another. And sometimes it would be things that we would think would be very, very simple uh, or that people would instantly get. But it's not, that's not the case because, first of all, everyone's in a panic and, and you're not necessarily able to process everything in an optimal way. Uh, but also speed of information is is incredibly important so that mm -hmm. that role that we've had to to play has become even more important than ever and i um i would like that to be a permanent fixture in our relationships with with, with our clients yeah. uh, okay. well and also too i think i think that what you just said you've done and, and to the scale you've done it a lot of people have a, a broad perspective but they're missing a piece to the puzzle and sometimes inadvertently or you know just through conversation of sharing what you know you've provided them that piece of the puzzle, like oh, that makes sense now and click. Now they have a, a path to something they didn't have before because you gave them something they didn't know about, but that perspective helped them put the whole picture together. It just, you don't know where you contribute no. until all of a sudden it pops up and they're like, thank you, that's perfect. And you're like, what did I say? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's, I mean, that was also one of the reasons why we wanted to get this out earlier rather than, you know, waiting to see how everything settles down because the we, we needed to be out there essentially in the action to see what's happening in order to be of use to ourselves and, and anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of where we are right now in terms of, you know, we've, we've passed that initial kind of shock and awe of, of COVID 
and we're all looking at you know occupancy rates now and they've kind of returned a little bit better and they've kind of like plateaued out and people are starting to think about the future and how to how to plan for that and and uh, what what recovery looks like and i don't think there is a clear path for everyone right now so we're we're trying to amass that information from as many corners as possible to, to come up with a, a game plan for for ourselves and, and for our clients which is also why i love having conversations like this because um you know the the more brains we can amass in in a room the better yeah and here you have at least I, one and a half <laughs> I, that's generous i was gonna go for just a half but okay i was giving okay. mark i was giving mark the one <laughs> oh, oh, oh okay okay well in that case <laughs> Brains galore. <laughs> we, we were on we were on a call a, a few weeks back, and uh, one of the guests described us as a think tank, and I nearly fell off my chair. I'm yeah. like, really? no, you you've missed the entire reason of this. Yeah, more, more of an Are empty you gas to... tank. <laughs> I mean. More of a oh, pondering tank. We ponder. No, I, I, I'm still thinking about pie right now. I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Mark. See, you missed an episode where I brought on a oh, uh, a, a cleaning bio, a company. Yes, a, a company that actually like cleans like really messy things. Sanitation, like, sanitation. Yeah. Yeah, and so he was explaining like how to clean correctly to to sanitation, and okay. he kept mentioning biofilm. Uh, any, uh, which had us all like, you could see all of our faces, like every time we were like, uh, but then he would say poop and everyone would chuckle we'll just laugh because we're, we're all a bunch of children. Because common, common denominator. Poop and we just yeah. smile. Yeah. Um, if, if you want to hang up now, Mark, please feel free. It's no problem. Problem. We're, we're, we're already here. We're, we're deep in it. Let's go on. What is yeah. biofilm? Uh, oh. It is, uh, on all surfaces. It is a layer of living organism. And he You're talked welcome. about the Put everywhere. Yeah, his company was as as hotels had closed and those that had stayed open. Uh, he was talking about the differences between it was easier to clean a hotel that was in operation than it was that has to kind of get restarted because there's a, a a lot more scalability to it and so forth and so on. And he was talking about the methods and methodology at the time and and, and to put it into a timestamp that was back when we still considered surface contact as vulnerable as airborne at that mm -hmm. time we didn't see yeah. that, that there was a variation between the two so the hotels were trying to be extreme in their clean, cleaning policies and he was being called in to do all this stuff and he was trying to explain the very logistic process of doing all this and yeah we just went to the least common denominator when he was talking about how he had to clean stuff but by the way biofilm is actually hard to kill as well so yeah. just now that you have that image, you also have the image that it actually takes like 10 minutes of disinfecting to kill a biofilm. Yeah. So Love we were looking at the fact that a lot of hotels doing the spray and wipe really wasn't really doing anything other than making people feel good that something was being done compared right. to truly sanitizing or cleaning. The difference between cleaning and sanitization actually was a conversation too. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a good conversation. Yeah, fun, fun, fun discussions. Yeah. Yeah. So while I have you guys, Speaking of you know one and a half brains or, or, or think tank, um, I'm going to throw out one of the more difficult questions that I've been asked uh, and see if you guys can help me out with it. Because um, I've I've been talking a lot about the different opportunities for the hospitality sector that are that exist now or in the immediate future. You know, talking about people wanting to get out of major cities and, and be more secluded. So obviously that presents opportunities for suburban areas or like you know the the great outdoors, nature. But what do you do if you're a you're a hotel in in a densely populated metropolitan area that probably relied a lot on group travel, corporate travel, none of which is remotely close to what it used to be? Um, do you just give up? Is, right. or, or is or is there is there some sort of hope? Well, so it's actually it's an interesting question. Lauren and I talked about this in an HSMAI presentation uh, to um, uh, Montreal. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the comments we made was, you know, a lot of these cities no longer are nearly as congested on mm -hmm. their streets and in their, you know, the things on why you would go experience the city. So actually marketing it as a chance to mm -hmm. have a better experience in the city, um, because one thing we definitely learned through this is there's a large amount of people who just really don't care and and we're willing to travel and you can even see it uh i'm a big forum nerd and almost every forum i'm on there's a discussion about i can't wait to start cruising again and in my head i'm like 
I can't. Biofilm. Biofilm. Biofilm, biofilm. biofilm. biofilm everywhere. <laughs> Salty biofilm. Uh, <laughs> do not Google that. Do not Google that. Do not Google that. Um, but, but there is an opportunity because, you know, listen, you know, if you don't live in a densely populated city, uh, you may avoid you may have avoided them anyways because you're not used to that type of congestion. You're not used to that type of chaos. Um, you actually have an opportunity to introduce an audience to what is great about these cities um, and 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 really sell it as like this is probably the the most open will ever be. Yeah. I think I heard some really interesting pivots as well. And one of the things that this this pandemic um, has has heaped upon these in, in bucketfuls is just how quickly people can go do an absolute 180 in something they've never done before. For example, mm -hmm. there was uh, one hotel. Um, it was a presentation that Tris and I did for Ahoa, and one of the hotels asked us, oh, I'm a business hotel. Um, that's not going to happen here. One of my ideas was... Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was fli flipping from my, because it had wired internet into all the rooms, and they actually said, oh, we're going to flip it, and we're now going to bring in people for LAN parties to do old school gaming in rooms. I was like, that's a brilliant mm -hmm. idea. Yep. And then she said, and then, with the, then the question, and I, I thought, oh, God, these are a bit spicy, these questions. And the next one was, and I have a massive meeting and event space, what shall I do with it? And that was a bit of a blindside question, and so we sort of said, uh, why not put on a jobs fair for people in the hospitality industry who've been laid off? Oh, brilliant. We'll do that. Okay. I was like, whoosh, whoosh, dodged the bullet there. Yeah. Oh, so, 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 Lauren, so. That, I forgot to tell you, because Lauren has been touting for weeks that hotels should like partner with their local communities to help with schooling yeah. and things like that. Yeah. I actually had a hotel have to pause service with us because they're shutting down as a hotel for the next six months because they're housing the local school system in and throughout their hotel three cheers awesome and That's i was awesome. like i gotta tell lauren this <laughs> <laughs> one of lauren's ideas <laughs> worked the one idea the one idea the one, one idea one. <laughs> you know even a blind pig can find a turnip i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> so one okay. of the other things we were saying as well is i think one of the questions that, that, that came to us was you know i've, I've got a big um uh, you know, reception area as, as well. Not not just the the meeting space, but it's because um, there was. I mean, we're going back a little while. It's there was there's a worry about food and things like that, and restaurants were still shut down or um, uh, weren't open. They were offering a takeout service. It was it was it was bring the re bring the restaurants, bring the bring the local community into the hotel. If you've got space, it's about build exactly what we've been doing. It's about building those partnerships. Building those partnerships with the, with the local vendors that would um, that you would otherwise see as competition, um, or you know that you knew that were there, and you know your hotel guests would go to. In any case, bring them in, uh, whether it's you know uh, uh, restaurant food, takeout food, whatever it would be. Bring food bring trucks. that in. Yeah. Food trucks. That's the anything, one. Yeah. anything barely edible. I think the, the, uh, you might some some might have hurdles to overcome. There might still be a little bit. I, I don't know. There might still be a little bit of pride in not wanting to admit total defeat and partnering with other hotels. But I would say if there's ever a time in history where the industry needs to sort of let its guard down, put its hands up and say, I can't do this myself. I read the stats. I think it was 70 odd percent, 60 odd percent of uh, hotels in the next four years, if there's not a turnaround, are just going to, they're just going to go. They're, they're, they can't survive at all. Mm -hmm. This is the time where you say, Hey, um, we've actually got a really great deal with this, um, oh, I don't know, digital marketing agency. Do you want to partner with them? We've negotiated this discount f with this attraction. Do you want part of that as well? Just it, it, Again, just the rela even chasing relationships with your competitors, it, it benefits everybody if there's a... If well, there's first of all, it's always smart anyways. Mm -hmm. I've always been close friends with my competitors. So at, right. at, at Easy Yield, I was really close with the owners of Ray Tiger. I was mm. really close with the owners of Ray Gain. And here's why. They're so it's similar fine. to me. No, they're so similar. <laughs> they made the same decisions I made. I see that right. as like, these people know what I'm doing more than anyone else. And because of that, yes, there was a lot of friendliness between our companies. It wasn't a nasty uh you know uh, aggressive thing it was like oh hey 
um, FYI, we turned down a, a piece of business because it wasn't right for us right now. You should call them because they're shopping. And that would happen both ways. Uh, and so after I sold, I remained friends with these mm -hmm. people. You should be friends with your competitors. They are the most similar people to you in this like business. Well, to, to amplify a little bit of what Ben said too, is we, we're so used to our old uh, paradigm. See, it's one of my new main oh, words. It's, huh. <laughs> he's saying paradigm, Mark. But I yeah. say paradigm, it's, it's, it's my way of saying the word. But anyway, we've been so used to competing with each other in market and our, my fair share, my part. I mean, we literally have reports that focus on my share. What am I getting compared to everybody else? And, and Mark, you brought it up earlier. We're all in the same relationships right now. We're all in the same space. And relationship building is the key element to this. If we're all ding dong, the witch is dead, the big old box hotel in downtown, wherever is gone, that's one less thing to bring people in future tents to your market. Mm -hmm. You're reducing the value of your destination by reducing that aspect of what's there. So right now it's better to, as Ben says, collaborate, work with your local business saying, hey, I have this audience that's about what I do, my hotel. What is your audience about your restaurant? What is your audience about this? There's a certain, and, and it's like doing old fashioned marketing stuff. What's your SWOT analysis on this? What's my real asset value? I have a very grand hotel, huge reception area, big chandeliers, lots of rooms. So, you know, rather than bemoaning the fact that you have huge conference space, flip the positive to it. I have controlled space. I can mitigate going through safety protocols to get to an open common area. I can, and, and as we're all struggling to try to create some sort of normal version of what it was like at a conference or what it was like when we could get together, you see what Microsoft Teams is doing like, oh, now I have a little theater seats. I can put little people's faces in. And, you know, they're trying to somehow visually normalize interactions the way they were before. Well, what about the next iteration of this where you create a conference in a large space that could create the distance of safety that the municipalities may still require in your market? And through that, you now have a full stage again with all the fun lights and all the backdrops and the screens and the distancing between your panelists and things and project that as your event and where you can have some physical audience because we're watching football right now. It's a lot better when they throw a few people in the stands as distant as they may be. It's better to listen to them yelling Newton than some guy going, oh, forgot to hit the wrong button. Audience laughs, you know. <laughs> baseball, when you see that foul ball hit one of those cardboard things in the head, though. Awesome. Oh, you're just waiting for it, isn't it? You know? <laughs> you know, we know that a lot of things, like we know that uh, like the VR stuff and everything are trying to get into the realm of, oh, VR. And it's never really going to take. It's never going to replace the physicality of engagement. But there is going to be transition processes out of this. And those huge big boxes, going back to your original question mark, is that, they have that space ability. They have the location capability. And as Edward mentioned earlier, the diminished traffic, you can go to Cats now. I probably not have to wait three hours to get set down. Hey, yeah. that I'll take that every day. I'll, I'll wear five masks and a goggle if I have to get to go and get one of those sandwiches. Heck yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, in, in answer to your question, food. Food. That's, well, that's that is kind of, yes. <laughs> no, and, and food, food is a key driver too. You know, you think about it, especially with a smaller market, let's say in Omaha, Nebraska, as opposed to a, a New York City, right? And you think about who is going to those markets. You know, one of the number one rules of travel has always been they're not going there just to see you as a hotel, and unless you're a destination resort and that type of thing. Unless but you're in you're Nebraska. A, what, what? I'm sorry. Unless you're in Nebraska. Yeah, unless you're in Nebraska, because because you know, that's the only there. reason. Exactly. <laughs> Quit picking on him. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, best right. boy, Mark, you know. <laughs> the, the, the people that are coming there are coming there for you. We're seeing drive markets, right? We all know the drive markets are a key feeder right now. And it's those people that have been pent up and they're finally getting a chance to have a parent's night out. They've got a babysitter for the kids and they're going, all right, let's go into town. Well, guess what? So they go into town and they're looking not just to stay at your hotel, but to do something around there. So if you can partner with those things that are in the area, the restaurants, the attractions, whatever it may be, who, by the way, are hurting just as much as you are, mm -hmm. that's an opportunity for everybody to win and for you to attract that business. Yeah, that's definitely something. Hey, that Ben, you're well. a minute away from getting in trouble. Thank you. Uh, I sent him a text. I sent him a text. Anyway, how, sorry, Mark. how many jobs did you have to tell that you're going to do for your wife to come on this? Because you made it sound like you were going to negotiate, but that negotiation I know is her giving you more things to do. 
<laughs> you've met my wife, buddy. You know, oh, I, know, I, know. Like. Um, I am going to have to drop off real soon, but I just wanted to, to, to show and tell this real quickly before I went. We, we started talking earlier about um, how companies and, and different parts of the industry have pivoted. I don't know if you guys caught this, the, um, the Cantus flight to nowhere. Mm-hmm. Did you I see this? That, yeah. yeah, the, the it's an eight, nine hour flight and a Dreamliner. The ticket sold out in 10 minutes. And it's just a sightseeing tour. They just go up, fly around, show you some pretty impressive parts of nature, and then land exactly where you took off. It, we still haven't come up with a better phrase than revenge travel, and I'm going to give it some serious brain power tonight. But if ever there was an indicator that people are just itching to travel again, right. it's paying thousands of dollars to get on a plane, fly around a bit and land, and then just go, Ooh, I had a spot. <laughs> <laughs> that is just what I needed, a little bit of jet lag. Like uh, that, it's you're back in the same time zone. I would be jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> I think flying around for eight hours would do it for me, mate. Uh, yeah, I think true. it's a great example of pivoting. A really smart move, and you know, airlines have got to keep themselves afloat as well as well as the cruise lines. No pun intended. Um, but the the fact it sold out in ten minutes for me was just that's mm. the headline. People are, are desperate to get back moving, um, and I can't wait until it. I can't wait until everything comes slightly more back to normal. I love it. I love the brilliant ideas coming out of Australia too. <laughs> so I, Stuart, I, I thought Singapore would be, be very similar because Singapore has this problem of that they're basically an island nation uh, that can't go anywhere. So they did something very similar actually where you get on a plane in Singapore, go fly around a little bit, land in Singapore. Hmm. Ben, before oh, you yeah. go, is there anything else of great words of wisdom that you have, insights, key perspectives, things that could save the universe? Uh, no, hold on. Um, <laughs> oh man, you guys are going to get me into trouble so much. Uh, that's the fun part of all this. <laughs> no, Ben, stay that's longer. Right. Come, on, come on, come on, play, Ben. Come on. Yeah, come on. Yeah, Kim, I'll be with you in a minute. Come on. No, What's 50 more minutes to go? Citizen M. <laughs> come on. I'll just wait for the door to get kicked down and to like, drag me out, and you're going to see me just getting pulled downstairs. <laughs> Bye, Ben. <laughs> You see, the the you see where, where you know where the wife comes running in, in shock, running so, in here just. She she out. She's Honestly. watching the show in the other room right now and looking at it. Like, ben, you. And by the way, this is how he gets in trouble. Is, <laughs> yes, this he is can't it. leave because the banter just keeps going. <laughs> This is the last thing, and then I'm definitely going. Uh, I took a screenshot of this one, so it's Citizen M Hotels um, offer a corporate subscription now. I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. caught this. Um, three nights a month, no blackout dates, which you could be really cheeky and get some different rooms. Uh, three hours of meeting rooms, daily workspace, Wi-Fi, breakfast, yada, yada, yada. £500, £600 per month per user. That's another, amazing. It is, and another great pivot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have the occupancy. Uh, what should we do? Bundle, bundle, get people out of the house who are working from home. That's super smart, and I can't wait to, to see how that goes for them. So yeah. uh, in similar vein, um, we started working with a fitness resort. And, um, Ed, I'm going. <laughs> oh, no. Ben. Nice no. try. No, ben, this is right I, to you, buddy. This is, this is your thing. No, hold on. No. This is good. <laughs> so they took this downtime to build out an entire architecture okay, so that people who've been to their resort can subscribe to the lifestyle that they you know, showed them while they were at this resort. And you actually have check-ins with their nutritionalists and things like that. Uh, they actually built it all out. So now they have a subscription service that pre-guests can subscribe to, to like get fit enough for the program. Uh, and then post to continue upkeep. Ben, Ben, ben your replacement ben. from South Africa's hey in. You're good. You can get. <laughs> hey, Ben. Yes, Dave? Hey, uh, your wife just called me. She says, get off the bloody. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good weekend, guys. Mark, great to meet you. And thanks nice for meeting you. Oh, ben, thanks Bye, for guys. being here. Say hi to your wife for us if she talks to you. <laughs> Bye, Bye, buddy. Uh, Stuart, meet yeah. me. Meet Mark with Elementary. Hey, Mark. I felt I felt like we were kindred spirits. Everything you say is music to my ears. I've been listening for the past hour, just um, unpacking boxes. So awesome, awesome. Cool. For a brief moment, the Commonwealth out, outnumbered the uh, the Yanks here just yeah. for for about thirty seconds. So <laughs> <laughs> it was always a fleeting ownership, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, if, if we wanted you back, we would have taken you back a long time ago. That's yeah. right. We're asking, and you're not taking. Um, so, Mark, uh, I I appreciate um, 
you taking the time and not being afraid when you initially jumped on and we were already spun off into craziness. No um, it is voluntary from here for you on whether or not you want to continue. Now, just understand if you want to continue, you need to actively interrupt someone to speak. Yeah, Otherwise, you, out, yeah. you yeah. won't speak. And you need <laughs> yeah. to sign a waiver to say that we won't hurt your feelings. I can, yes. I, I can kind of see the energy. Now, unfortunately, I have a hard stop at uh, 11.30 my time, but this has been a lot of fun. I, I did want to piggyback on, on um, what you were saying earlier about being really friendly with your competitors, even in you know non-COVID times. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that, that's really been hi highlighted in this, being closer to other agencies that you know do similar things is, um, it's pushed us to do something that we should have done more of in, in, in regular times anyway, which is be much more distinct in our offering. Because in, in the world of marketing, in the world of hospitality marketing, we all kind of tick similar boxes, but really everybody does it in, in a slightly different way, either mm -hmm. through the services that they offer or the methodology or the industries that they cover. And I think that's something that we should have been doing anyway, is like bringing something unique to the table so that we're not just competing on bodies on the ground or pricing on that side, because that, that's really a losing proposition for everyone involved, right? Because it's not good for the agency and their bottom line, but also for, for, for the clients, you know, and, and you know, we've talked about this before in, in, in the context of like tourism boards is that you have five different agencies who, who show up and are offering exactly the same thing. And that, that that's not helping anyone do, to do better marketing. So, um, this has accelerated that process because now we've had kind of very frank conversations about like, hey, on on our websites, we all say we do these things, but how do you actually do it? And let me right. tell you what I'm actually really good at and what's the stuff where I tell people I'll do it, but we know what the deal is, right? And then when, when, you, when you have the comfort and the ability to have those conversations, then you'd be like, oh, I actually don't want to compete with you on this thing because you're, you're a lot better at it than I am. Why? But... I've got this thing coming in. Um, I think you'd be a better fit for it. Why don't you take it and uh, let's just figure something out, right? Yep. And and then we don't have to do the dance of both submitting proposals where maybe none of us will get it. Right. 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 So that's, no, uh, you make a great point because a lot of websites for a lot of agencies, you're reading and going, I still don't get what exactly you do. I know you say you do everything, save the world and everything else, but what exactly do you do? And you're to the point, it's very frustrating for that. And a lot of, it confuses a lot of people, like should I even talk to them? Because it sounds like the same thing is over here, 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 and here. When now we have the distinct, which has been kind of fun with the show here is, we all in some way occupy the same space in some category. And, so, and But we do it in so different ways. It's like, no, 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 this, this guy or these people really would fit you perfect because they're not going to want me squirrel off to the side. They want stewards. No, it's a straight line. We're going to go through that wall, you know. <laughs> so we're all different in how we do things. Stewart's smarter and sexier than me anyway. So, I mean, he, he kind of wins all the arguments. You know, I'm going to channel my inner Tim Peter a little bit. He always talks about differentiation. It's not about just being different. It's about providing unique value that people are willing to pay for. And I think everyone on this dais does that in, in their own way. And hotels can learn from that, too. I mean, it's, it's one of the big oh, yeah. opportunities that's going to come out of this is how do hotels stand out in, from the noise? Because everyone's going to be competing a lot more aggressively than they used to. They're not going to be sitting there just harvesting the intent that already existed. They've got to go hunting for their, their food, and they're going to do it a lot more aggressively. So how do you differentiate yourself by providing unique value that people are willing to pay for? That's going to be the key. I think that's the question that, that every, I mean, everyone was asking it already, but now there are even more variables that you have to contend with because like, uh, like you guys were saying earlier, hotels are ne necessarily going to have to change what it is that they offer in order to be able to survive and compete. And so how are people going to know who you are anymore? Because you, you yourself have had to morph into something new. And so you have to be very distinct and very clear about what it is that you bring to the table, which long term theoretically, should be good for you anyway. Well, uh, I mean, or you can go the age old tested, make sure there's a checklist that tells everyone you have an iron and ironing board above <laughs> the fold of every color TV, color TV, heated pool, color TV, heated pool, make sure they're yeah, in there. Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi. Air, air, air conditioning. Make sure you tell me you have air I mean, you know, <laughs> this is what you should be selling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ironing board. Got it. Got it. Anyway, uh, okay. point, a really valid point about the about the websites. So Lauren, you mentioned it, and we've all just taken uh, you know the, the Mickey out of it. There, that 
there's there's still so many hotel websites and not just hotel websites any other website that you go to that it takes you a good few seconds to figure out what the hell it is that they do and still sometimes at the end of it i'm still not quite certain what what you know what it is they're actually offering yeah but they have a fantastic time on site Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> and, and amazing that, that hero image is beautiful, man. That hero oh, image. That's right, on the whole page, it's like through the yeah, room. I mean, a synergistic blend of high dynamic uh, variabilities <laughs> on uh, holistic. Uh, go, what? Using <laughs> machine learning. All right. AI. So, so Mark, Mark is going to still be too polite. He does have to wind down yes, in five minutes. It's so, Mark, close. if people want to connect with you or learn more about Elemental, where should they go? Sure. So the first place would be the website elemental.co. And unfortunately, we have uh, an uh, alternative spelling of it. So it's E-L-M-N-T-L dot C-O. You can also check us out on LinkedIn, on Instagram. We're very active on all those different channels. And uh, yeah, just check out some of the work that we've done uh, and drop us a line if you're interested in chatting more. I mean, this is, uh, I would say, if you want to remember one thing about us is that we, we cover travel as as uh, as a category broadly speaking so we work across um tourism boards hotels uh and then incorporate our other clients like hospitality and uh and um, spirits and food and beverage so a lot of what we do is cross industry brand partnerships that's probably the thing that that we love doing the most and and makes us different to to other agencies uh so if that rings a bell for anyone please i'd love to chat about it um and Thank you all for having me today. This has been a lot of fun. This, I, I didn't know what to expect, but <laughs> this is far worse. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> now you understand why I didn't really tell you a lot about this. <laughs> Mark, yeah. Mark, uh, Mark where unfortunately, you unfortunately uh, you get to be with us whenever you would like. You're more than welcome to join. We'd love to keep you in the loop, but whenever you'd like to join us, you're more than welcome to pop in. Uh, this is what we do every Friday. Uh, only plus another hour or so, and, and, and we asked you for only a half hour, and you gave us an hour. So we sincerely appreciate the additional time by far, uh, and, and the insights and so forth. And, and Ed, thank you for making the connection with Mark with us, so that we can. Have yeah, him on you the can show. see why I thought he'd do okay, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you don't fit at all, Mark. Really, I, I really. I need, I need a better background. Like I think uh, everyone's got a cool. But I mean, obviously, Ed, you're just showing off with your posters. Oh uh, uh, yeah, but hey, but look, 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 look. For, I, I will, kudos for the swag T-shirt. Okay. Kudos for the swag T-shirt. Yeah, but okay. listen, the, the best part. <laughs> he does have the logo in the background. Oh, he does have the logo in the background. So very nice. Very nice. it's not uh, as if he's not totally representing, but yeah. yeah um, you know. And Mark, do, do you, just because you are multilingual, do you feel, because we, we translate this in 11 languages, do you think I should throw some Mandarin in this week or just, you know? 100%. I'm very curious to see what the Mandarin translation looks oh, like. Oh, dude, it's probably going to be really, you're going to laugh at it. It's probably going to be more humorous for you to try to read the Klaus Gaffney Mandarin, knowing that it's probably already screwed up anyway. For your translation. Albeit, because of the way Lauren structures his sentences, his part will make a ton more sense. It's all backwards. Really better. Yeah, it's <laughs> Mark, thank you very much for your time, and we'll make sure that all the notes go out, and, and I'll send you a link to all this stuff. And I'll, oh, if you don't mind, I will send you Isaac's information because, like I said, he's in country in Thailand, and he's not doing anything right now. And if you need anything in the country, he's great at it. Yeah, he's really a good time. guy. Send it across. All right, thanks a lot, gentlemen. Right. Appreciate it, Mark. Bye, Mark. Thank, thank you. you. Don't thank you. hit the stop button. Just close the tab. Just close your browser. Don't. It's funky. Yeah, don't. Don't. <laughs> all right, all right. Don't end the show. <laughs> oh, All right, and gentlemen, before you get into your crazy banter, I have to go as well. Um, mm. Thanks for uh, humoring me on uh, bringing in Mark. I, 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 yeah, when I brilliant. found out he was behind, you know, buy now, stay later, I was like, dude, you got to come on the show. Yeah. So, no, that was awesome. That was yeah. awesome. Even though he, he somewhat, some, for some reason, has an aversion to vowels in his yeah, business. Yeah. Yeah. Rations one word. The beginning. Well, the, the name of his company is just like how all of you speak. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. 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 That must so be I, the Australian spelling. I thought you'd all just be comfortable with that. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it was brilliant to it. And you're right. It it uh, it goes back to what he brought to the market was straightforward and simplistic, and it didn't get overly complex. And he wasn't trying to be too many things. And yeah, Brilliant and I, I, I think at the end of the day that the thing that makes him a fit with his show and the thing that makes him great is his philosophy on business, right? And and I think he shares the same that a lot of us folks do. It's, it's Indeed. not competitive. It's not seeing how much I can do for me. It's not about me. It's about them. It's about how can we help solve problems for other people. Yeah, for real. Yep. Yeah. For real. Yeah. All right, gents. Uh, 
Ed, Have a fantastic you, weekend. Find you. What, 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 you can what, find what, out what? about Flip2, flip.to. You can find me on social media, Edward St. Ange. Do not connect with me on Twitter unless you want to be trolled about college football. But every other network, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Ed. Appreciate the time. Have Thanks, fun the rest everyone. of the day. Cheers. Bye. 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 Yeah. Mr. Ed. Every time you say that, I think of the show. No, right. A horse is, of course, a horse, of course. And this is, yeah, okay. Yeah, we're good. Not that no, I'm I like the whole time. I've lost top of our sense. Um, you know. <laughs> so, Tris, hey, look, it's nice to see your handsome face, dude. Thank you very much. Yeah, I had lots of uh, lots of family stuff to do. It's been my wife's birthday and then other, other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to go at the wife's birthday. I, I tried to get out. I said, look, it's the show. Come on. Doesn't go down well when you say that. What's more important, Chris? What's more that's important? what I said. That's what I said. And apparently <laughs> that's not the thing to say, apparently. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say nice things about you, Stuart, when you were listening on your phone beforehand, but I didn't even get the chance to come in. But now that you're back, I, was, I just want to tell you, I was going to say nice things about you. Because well, a lot of what Mark was saying about camaraderie, and I was going to give the examples about how you've been reaching out with other agencies that hitherto up until COVID, you really weren't working with you now, you know, yeah. now working in collaborations. So yeah, and to be fair, I mean, folks like Milestone, we we had a good relationship before COVID. We just never really formalized it, right? We we, we Tammy had known for a little while, and you know, we bump into each other. So we've always been cordial and shared ideas, and you know, watched what they do. So just formalizing that a little more and inviting them onto the show was a no brainer for us. When every, especially at the beginning, when everyone was just like, "Holy cow, I have no oh, idea what yeah. to do." You know, yeah. 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 industry events out there too, because we used to be able to all get together and get have to have a drink or two and collaborate and see what the others were doing. And, you know, everybody's a little bit more uh, giving when they've had a few drinks in them and you can find out more information <laughs> from them. And that's and why I give all the time. Cause I'm always drunk. That's yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a giver, Stuart. You're a giver. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Oh, in, 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 in light of the fact that, Stuart, you guys are going to be rolling out a podcast about IP tracking. Well, it, it's about the, 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 you know, our industry has this thing that it does. It, it sensationalizes. I don't know if, if other media channels do this, but the hospitality industry certainly does. In you know, it's the death of this. It's the death of that. Every day. Like SEO has literally had 12 deaths at this point, right? And it's, <laughs> it's like the phoenix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, we had we had like mobile getting and oh, nonsense, right? Blockchain was going to destroy everything for a little while. AI was going to destroy everything for a little while. I knew it was yeah. actually COVID that did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was what happened when blockchain and AI combined. They created COVID. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But what the soup du jour right now for a lot of folks seeing so much much article, much content written about it is this this. Entry into a cookieless world is what a lot of people call it, which is really not accurate. When you, it's it's the death of third-party cookies, right? Which is probably a good long overdue thing for the industry. And so we're, we're preparing a, a, a podcast. We're going to record it actually on Monday. We usually record on Fridays. We record it on Monday. It'll get published next week. But we've been doing our research, and and I just keep running into the same problem in my head where I'm like, if you're a good marketer, this doesn't affect you negatively at all. In fact it's going to only affect the people that are doing a shitty job. And so I kept coming to this conclusion. I'm like, this can't be the case. Why is everyone freaking out about it? So I tried, I called the smartest person I knew. He didn't answer. So then I called Tim. He didn't answer. Then I called Ed. He didn't answer. So then I called Lauren. And so, um, wow. You should have probably been. The well, first nobody one. left. He had no more phone numbers. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, he butt dialed me and he had to ask something. Okay. Oh, crap. Well, so, but no, I talked to a handful of people, including Ed, including Lauren and, and some other folks. And, and they're like, I, I think you're right. You know, it's like the only people freaking out about this are the people that are way over committed to crappy advertising, like especially display advertising that doesn't really work and isn't accountable. And so I'm sitting here like saying, well, we've got a booking engine that doesn't have any third party cross domain tracking issues because it lives in the domain of, of the hotel website. We don't do anything shady where you can't really track it through first party cookies. So ah, meh, what's the big deal? So that that's probably going to be the, we're going to break it down, explain what, what a cookie is, what a first party, third party is. 
and break down why you really shouldn't care if you're doing things the right way. But I mean, I think that's that's I mean, I'd like to join that myself, actually. Mm. I think I, th I think that's really useful as uh, as well because we've had questions about it from clients saying, yeah. "What does this mean to, for our paid search right. services?" The basic said, it, it, "Is it going to stop?" Well, you know, Google's not literally going to cull its own right. bread maker. You know, at the end of the day, they they need to track yeah. know, Google Ads, Meta Search, everything else. Otherwise, they're going to lose money overnight, literally overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. One of my big selling points when I talk about MetaSearch is that I want to get that direct traffic to your hotel's website so you can do remarketing. And people will say, well, wait, remarketing is going to go away when all of this stuff goes to the camp. Well, yeah, no, not. And, that, and, by, and by the way, they've been saying this for three years now. So keeping that yeah. in mind, too. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we had the same with GDPR. We had, uh, uh, I remember being in, in very in-depth conversations, even with some lawyers telling me, oh, yeah, you know, that, that's just going to stop. I'm like, Google are not going to stop offering you remarketing because one it works two right. it makes a whole shed load of money and three there is a get out of jail clause in all of the um, the gdpr um uh, legislation that was written and i was, was trying to point this out lo and behold remarketing is stronger than ever you know it, it it never you know europe didn't stop having display remarketing uh, coming to them the moment it came in so yeah you've always brought this out over and over again is we are our own worst enemy when it comes to what we do yeah. Uh, marketers. I say that from a marketing perspective. We'll take a completely great platform that is great for the people who are using it and abuse the living bejeebers out of it yeah, we and will. try to leverage it to our marketing principles. Yeah, and, and we end up having to get rules for it, like GDPR and CCPA and all this. You know? Yeah, because uh, there's bad actors out there that are doing crappy things and then we all get punished. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, we can call names out and they're easy enough to do because they're the larger entities in our industry right now that are offering this massive retargeting that goes on, this massive follow-up yeah. of stuff. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, and they're the ones that are the, they're, they're screaming about how this is the end of times. I, I want because. someone to do this. I haven't found a client willing to do it, and I'm getting to the point where I might just pony up the money to do it, right? So one of these big ad, ad networks that claims all this attribution that they didn't really get, right, or they took – maybe charge, I don't know, let's say 12% 12, 12 commission on a seven day view through. Hypothetically, say someone was to do that, right? Look, yeah, seven, um, longer than I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm assuming someone might do that. I don't, I'm not gonna mention any names. Not any names. Run an A-B <laughs> test. Why, can I name? <laughs> run, run, run an A-B test and literally run some of your ads with blank creative for a period and see how much attribution they claim for those <laughs> blank <laughs> That's serious. <laughs> How great would that be, right? If, if if someone ran that and proved that there was no meaningful impact between running a blank ad and an actual ad, it shuts it down overnight. I, don't, that would be I, I wonder if the blank ad would, I'm, I'm fairly certain the blank ad would get disapproved. Maybe, oh, oh, okay. Run something completely unrelated. Just random. Like, yeah, just random. Picture, just put Lauren's face on there and have it click, <laughs> have it click to your website. Uh, well, they mean, might click on something, but it'd probably be to erase and permanently block, but that's that's it. But you know no, what I'm saying? You, no, one's, no one's done that scrutiny, and I, I want right. to see someone do it. And I'm getting we've, to the point we've, we've, we've been arguing this for so long. Attribution yeah. theft is real. We know this exists. We know these people drop themselves into the string, hijack the string take credit for the string. They do all these things and they're the ones that are beating the drum going, oh my God, they can't be doing this to us. They're now looking for, and they actually started looking for other channels of opportunity by going into the meta search space, Dean. You know, you've seen all these people crowd into your space of, oh, we do this for you, we do this for you because they're trying to find other avenues because they know they're on a short road for the rest of this stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And, 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 and this is, to your point, Stuart, clearing up the clutter, it's still gonna be used for those that are doing it right, that have the legitimacy of doing it, not Here's for the, the problem. Ones. Here's the problem, right? Those bad actors that, that have always sold snake oil and always will sell snake oil because they're not doing it to help people. They're just going to move on to the next thing. That's why we're seeing right. a lot of people jump into to, to meta search right now because well, it's the also, next thing that they also think. Also, you see a lot of them jumping into IP tracking, and that's kind of why I was bringing this up because. This is the, all of a sudden, if I've been asked it once, I've been asked a dozen times in the past day, uh, week as to, so what about this IP tracking stuff? 
And it scares me because, you know, what's what's with this gun? Does it shoot things? Put it, right. you know, <laughs> run, run through this mental checklist. Do you have five out of five on TripAdvisor and five out of five on Google for all your reviews, right? Are you maximizing your email database? Are you maximizing your social channels? Are you driving the majority of your bookings through your own website? If you If you say no to any one of those things, don't even think about IV tracking. It's so far out there in terms of what you should be focused on. You've got to get the fundamentals right before you start doing this stupid stuff that incrementally might have an impact, but it's such a distraction from the core of what you should be doing. Adele would look you right now. Adele would look you right now. She'd be jumping in. But she's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. What you say is that. Total sense. Every minute you're spending worrying about some obscure IP tracking nonsense is, is a minute you're not spending improving the guest experience, setting expectations appropriately, communicating effectively with your guests. We, we've been doing the sentiment study for 20 weeks now, right? It's this longitudinal sentiment study during COVID. And there's such a discrepancy between what guests are saying they want to hear about. You know, they want to hear about what they do, what the, the property is doing to keep them safe, the staff safe. They want to hear about the local area. They want to hear about what amenities are open. They want to hear about the cleaning practices. But then when we ask people that have actually traveled, what of these did get communicated? None of these things are being communicated. That's your marketing right there, fundamentally missing the mark. Do that yeah. before you do IP targeting. I, I told one one client that was asking about it. I said, you know, Madam Curie, you know, she was using uh, uranium and, and, and radiology and so forth, and she died because uh, as smart as she was and how cool she discovered things, she didn't realize she was messing with something that was going to destroy her eventually. And I said, IP tracking is a dangerous tool. Mm -hmm if put in the wrong hands. And there's a lot of people running around going, oh, I can tell you exactly your customer. Uh, there's some laws associated with this whole process, by the way, because when you start triangulating, I'm getting my IP address about who you are, then I know what your cell phone is, and that gets coordinated with your IP. Then I have your geolocation capability, plus also what you're using for medium. All of a sudden, you've gone from an avatar online where I know all the filtering capabilities of to, no, that's Lauren. Lauren's at that place now, and Lauren's over here, and Lauren's there. And that's dangerous. Here's the simple small test, right? If, if you're not willing to stand and look at the customer in the eye and tell them exactly what you're doing, then you shouldn't be doing it. If you right. if you think they would have a problem if you told them what you're doing, you should not be doing it. Exactly. Because everything you do should be in the interest of the guest. If you have that as your, your North Star, you're going to do things ethically. You're going to do things with the right um, approach. And, and you're going to ultimately win over the minds and the hearts of the guests. Mm -hmm. Still to this day, I mean, I, I was putting it in, even though there were old videos, it still made the same impression that I had when I first used them. I took a study that was showing Google's tracking capability with their phone. It was a news coverage that was done by the radio station or TV station in Washington, D.C. And I also took just them taking the time to go into their iPhone and seeing what was being tracked by iPhone, by yeah, Apple. Yeah. And it's still both of those scared the living bejeebers out of me. They didn't, as much as they may have said or been aware, they truly didn't understand mm -hmm. that Google knows when you went to the church or whether you went to a hospital or where you went, you know, that that information was what you accepted when you didn't read all that junk and said, sure, yeah, just as long as you get the thing running, blah, 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 whatever. And let alone the apps that hijack or use that information for much more far nefarious reasons than what even Google's using it for, that they even use it in worst cases. Well, that, so, was, one of the, that was one of the genius things that Facebook did by allowing you to log in to other apps using your Facebook ID. Right. Because mm -hmm. everyone's already logged into Facebook. Brilliant move by Facebook because they suddenly got data and access to information that they never, ever, never ever had access to. Right. Facebook, I barely post on Facebook, me personally, on my own account. But Facebook knows a whole metric ton about me because yeah. – I use it to get into various. I remember how scary it was when I first when they first started doing that, and I was in there trying to use filters. The data they allowed me to have access to, I'm like, you got to be acting kidding me. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, eventually they tightened it up after. It was the wild west, man. They they oh. were very much that that you know move fast, break and fix kind of mentality, and it's it was scary. We we yeah we could do a lot of bad things. You know, Cambridge Analytica style. If we'd wanted to, it, it was. They didn't have it locked down. Your privacy was not a primary concern to them back then. And not at all. Around a lot, but it's still not perfect.
No. Yeah, no, no, it's still not perfect, but you know, get based on what happened with uh, Analytica and everything else, they had to kind of pony up on some. But they even self admittedly that their largest clients still don't have really restrictions as to what they're allowed not to be able to see. They can still use a lot of the data based the on the, hmm? the honor system. We're, yeah, we're all, right. we're all oh, yeah, system. yeah. We trust you. That's the thing. You're talking about IP. It's actually Google that's making this change so that us mere mortals and and digital marketers can't use it. But Google's still got that data. Google will still do it, yeah. Google has still got access to so much more. They're just making it more difficult for um, non-Google employees to use that data. Your your Google ad retargeting, your Facebook ad retargeting is not going to be affected by this one bit. What's going to be affected is all small guys. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm someone, I wish Tim was on this because he calls them the frightful five, right, the big guys. But I, I, I'm more comfortable knowing that there's two or three known entities that are probably doing some bad stuff than anyone and their uncle could do absolutely anything. Personally, right. I, I'm more comfortable with that. But I'm hey, Virginia, sure I'm this idea. I didn't catch Virginia's thing. Total sidetrack, but YouTube, scary stuff when perpetuating protesting disruption for eyeballs. Bad actors getting revenue. How to stop that? Say that again. Oh, so, sorry. There's people on YouTube putting videos on there and, and getting revenue generated off that YouTube traffic for watching disruptive yeah. 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 So so we talked about this on the show before, right? How YouTube kind of pivoted in their algorithm. They used to have what was affectionately called the, the Gangnam style algorithm. Mm-hmm. Theoretically, right? Where where each each time you watch the video, Google's entire intent on YouTube is to get you to stay on the platform as long as possible to consume as many ads, right? That's the, the reason that it exists. It's it's not, you know, anything altruistic. It's to make money from ads. Mm-hmm. And the longer you stay on there, the more money they make from you. So their job is to to try to figure out what the best video to show you next is. So what they used to do was whenever you watch a video, they'd watch, they'd show you next up something that's related to that, but slightly more popular. And so eventually, theoretically, if you if you continued long enough, you're going to end up with on the most popular video on YouTube, which at the time was Gangnam Style, I saw, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the theory of, of what it was. Now what they do is very different and it's it's having a massive impact. Facebook does the same. So now they'll say, how do I keep you on longer? It's not about what's more popular. It's about what's going to be more intense related to what you're looking at. So what it does is it pushes people to the fringe. So this this is so if I watch, say, a, a Jordan Peterson video, right? He, he, some would argue he's kind of right wing, right? He would argue he's he's not really. He's a centrist, slightly right on, on some things. But then you might end up on a Ben Shapiro video. And then you might end up on some even further right extremist. And then eventually you're pushed out to this extreme rabbit hole on the extreme of whatever it was you started on. And it had, can go to the left too. But this is what's creating such a divide. Social media in general is creating this divide because if you look at my um, social feeds and you look at my wife's, because idealistically we're a little different in certain things, they're so far apart, even though we're very similar people, we just have some fundamental differences in, in our values. We see completely different things that reinforce and ex- push us out to the extremes of the fringe and everything. This yeah. this is the problem with social media today. It's the problem with YouTube. It's the problem with Facebook. It's definitely the problem with Twitter. Well, so. it also adds to the fact that we, we, we have, a, unfortunately, a, a culture that will authenticate what they see versus the verification of its accuracy. It's, true, yes. yeah. it's one thing to be exposed to things. I mean, free speech or whatever way you want to quantify the, the, the ability for people to put things up is one thing. The uh, authority that it's given through based on either a popularity scale and or frequency scale and or uh, the, the, the belief or affirmation of your own belief in the echo bubble that it creates, creates this momentum from it that really, from a, a more historical perspective, was more news based, where it would, I call it the Walter Cronkite thing. Walter Cronkite reported the news, didn't embellish it, didn't sensationalize it, didn't storyline it, didn't do anything other than this is what happened. That changed with CNN. 24 hour news cycle had to get filled up, it became a right. venue. Right. So now it turned into headlines and featureability and drama, drama and so forth. And then reality TV, you know, like, wow, well, you we can see the inside curtain. It wasn't the stylized 30 minute. We had a problem at the beginning at the top of the hour and it got solved at the bottom of the hour. It now turned into life cycles and but drama. And, all right. And to, to be entertaining, you've got to be a little more extreme in, in your. Yeah. So 
We've all been feeding this fire to this point, and now we're seeing accumulated. I, I'm actually going to be posting something on my Facebook because I've decided, you know, I'm not one of those political people or just share and certainly not to troll or anything, but I begin to slowly begin to put what I think is called <coughs> factual content for people. To me, I think of uh, the thing that I think that Holly mentioned is like silence is acceptance. I want people to know for that I'm engaged with what my perspective is on what's coming up. So I've posted things about that. And I still, you know, people come back at me and those that troll, I try to talk to them through it or something like this and say, look, based on facts, I'll talk to you about anything. I want to hear why you feel like the way you do, but based it in fact, don't just tell me I suck or I'm full of shit or whatever. You started slippery slope though, Lauren. I I guarantee if we look at your behavior on social 12 months from now, it's going to be more extreme in a direction. I don't know which Absolutely. one's already started. That's what I'm trying to say is that <laughs> I'm seeing is- so many posts on it now from people that I don't know or some of associated. You're going to double down literally- on your thoughts, right? You're going to get I- more extreme because you're feeling attacked by the others, right? And we right. all feel like we need to belong. We all need a tribe. We all need to feel like we're part of something bigger than us. It's it's human nature since the beginning of, of time. This is what this is why you see extreme views like people really buying into QAnon or flat earthers or chemtrails or whatever it is. You, you name the conspiracy theory, it's getting more traction. It's becoming more ma- mainstream to the point where mainstream media reports on this stuff for that very reason. Because you right. start they out actually incorporated into what they're saying. Right. Out, there's what? detractors. They shift you, and they shift you, and they shift you. And the, the more you shift, the harder the detractors, and the more entrenched you get in your opinion. You mean right. what I'm saying? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. The, the, the earth isn't flat. Are you telling me this now? <laughs> oh, no, don't worry about it. I'm sorry, Chess. You're from, from the north of England. I should, I should explain. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> over there. <laughs> yeah. But but to my point is, it's like what I'm doing now is um, – if. I, I will. If someone just has an opinion, hey, I think this is terrible. I leave it as is. But if someone tries to feed me, I know is non factual. I've literally gone through the process of unfollowing if I happen to be following them. And if it's shared, I deny the fact that I'll ever have it shared again, which I know is actually amplifying, to your point, Stuart, the severity of what eventually gets posted. And I'm actually beginning to work against it. I was like, this is great because now I actually get to go over and just keep hammering at this stuff because I want to see how bad this gets. I mean, I mean, that's why, like I said, Facebook for me, I follow just about everybody usually. And LinkedIn is the one I try to keep pure to my industry and coworkers. And I'm really trying to see how Facebook is working through this whole process. And it really plays exactly what you just said, Stuart. The more I work with it, the more it begins to amplify towards the extremism. It really is just like you're watching going, Wow, this is absolutely amazing that we're dealing with this platform, that this is what it's doing for it. So, well, yeah. it, like I say, it's that one upsmanship because every time you post something on, there's somebody, and it could be YouTube or Facebook themselves or a person that's on there, is all about, oh, you think that's bad? Wait till you see this. Right. And, you know, they got to go one level higher. One, and yeah. it's, it's our nature. So yeah, to get that back same off, yeah, you've got to you've got to have an elevated, right? It's the same. It's mm-hmm. the same as drugs, right? That first time you take a hit, does something. The second time, it's not as much. So you need to do more to reach that same. It's, it's yeah. exactly. uh, Virginia commented the same thing to it. It's 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 really not political. It's actually just polarity of opinions that are coming through with this. I do want to point out going back to a little bit of a hospitality side of things. I was actually making a future conversation anyway <laughs> with Marianne. Oh, we lost uh, Stuart. Stuart, we got a backdrop. No, no, no. Yeah, sorry. That was bad. Yeah. No, no. But it's the uh, Marriott, losing, Marriott losing 110 hotels. Whoopsie. Seems like IHG yeah. and Marriott have something in common. And you know what? It seems to make sense. Marriott just can't do what Marriott done, has been doing. Neither could IHG. This is beginning to be the fallout where ownerships are getting smart enough. And Sinesta, God golly, this is just brilliant on their part. They're getting a portfolio. Yeah that they wouldn't have had. Yeah. They're getting to claim back properties that they would never be able to get back without massive negotiations, fees, and losses. And they're able to get it handed to them for pennies on the dollar, $11 million uh, uh, default, and they get to pull back all that property and pull the flags off <laughs> all day, yeah. every day. That's amazing. If, if, you're not, if you're a major brand, one of the big guys, you fly that flag and you're not reconsidering the value proposition right now, then you're, you're missing the point. Because they they clearly laid off tremendous numbers of their staff. They haven't supported properties through this very well because they they locked you out of being able to do anything unique to your lo- location. So people are going to be leaving these these places in droves, in my opinion, going to smaller groups, even deflagging completely and going independent. I think that's the way of the future. 
And don't, and don't let the technology stop you, because I know that's one reason why a lot of people go to the brands, because, well, they've got the whole technology stack. They do. They've got the sales and marketing, the digital, all that kind of stuff. Look, there's ways to replace that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's getting easier by the by the year, by the day. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I've also, got, too, go ahead. It's not a booking engine. They can have their own one. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Right. Yeah, if you know if anybody has a booking engine store, let, you know, just say up, you know, what, what, anybody, you know, anybody? <laughs> all of that stuff is readily available and vendors are making deals like like crazy right now because they're all looking for business i want i want to attach up uh, to tackle not attack but bring up something about our 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 industry as to how it kind of connects all together so your gm you're sitting at your hotel or your dsom or whatever you want to call yourself you're at the exact level for your hotel limited service to full-scale blown out resort if your brand, you actually have three masters. You have the owner of the building. They may or may not be actively engaged. You have the management company who is juxtaposition to be the person that facilitates what you need. And then you have the brands that you have to answer. And I, I know from having firsthand experience, when brands showed up for brand evaluations, we raised the brand, brand, brand flag in the front of the house. You know, as soon as they left and management showed up, we raised the management flag. You know, and when owners showed up, we did the same thing. And they all have different agendas and different focuses. The only commonality is revenue generation. After that, it's a gambit as to what they agree on. I mean, well, everybody wants money. But other than that, this, there's this really no problem with that, right? Not one of those three stakeholders that you mentioned really cares about the guest experience. That's the problem. Not right? one that's of them has their primary objective. That's the thing. And that's the part I'm trying to bring to you is of anybody all out of all of those the management company should be the most focused on developing the guest centric percent because that's literally the key element that makes everybody happy if well, we the do owners that, thought, they would be too right because ultimately that's it's how so true brand but we know that those owners bought it because it's an investment brand got it because they get franchise fees but really the honest is on management companies to really pony up especially at this time what's going on and take the lead is saying they're depending on the, the management company they might be a public company so then they they really only care about stock price you know all said and same but out of the three i would put the stake on them to say that they're the ones that have to step forward and take the lead right. on developing what the property so needs to best that. large scale management companies is is not always been great because they they try to do what a lot of large scale agencies do which they try to commoditize the offering they try to find efficiencies through scale mm -hmm. and you you can't do that in hospitality i mean there's certain areas obviously bulk buying and, and there's a lot of things processes things like that but at the end of the day you've got to give autonomy to the the boots on the ground to the people that are actually integrating with the staff and give them empower them with freedom to make sure that the guests are having a great time. Yep. I have a few relationships with clients. I'm not going to call by name. I always leave it. I mean, just, it's fun. It's not fun. It's, it's uh, disheartening in some ways as to the politics associated with the methodologies of what they're trying to do. Uh, they're caught up into, unfortunately, the corporate politics of fulfilling what's being asked of them to do, but losing the purpose of why they're doing it. Uh, and, and this is that unique opportunity as we're talking about what we as agencies have collaboratively done together of them rallying together internally as a management team to say, let's do what's best for our pro the people that we're providing products and services for. And from that, all the things we're wanting to accomplish by that happen. You know, mm -hmm. by taking care of our guests, we're actually going to be able to do all the things by working with the team at the property as a collaboration. Because I remember from the property perspective, when corporate came in, okay, dog and pony show, you know. And then, you know, when I was in the corporate side, I dreaded going to a property because I know as soon as I walked in the door, everybody was acting differently because of what I was representing when I walked in the door. And I'm sitting there going, guys, no, I was one of you. And they're like, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure you were, sure you were. Yeah, you're yeah. such a funny guy, yeah. Yeah, we, we love you, yeah, you were. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. I'm sure by now everyone has seen this, but if, if you haven't, Go check out Simon Sinek's video on the Golden Circle. Like the start with why. It's his his thing, and it. I mean, it's a game changer. Yeah, okay. I've got the books out there. But but I guess to the point of this is this is the time to question everything. Hmm. Brand isn't supporting what brand said it was going to do. So management services need to step in and say, "Wow, we're next man up." 
Okay, we're telling all these owners of these hotels, multi-branded or independent or whatever they are, that we're their resource for solving their issues for operating their hotels. So but what are we, we going to do? About it fewer people because we had to make a bunch of layoffs because that revenue. Right, issue. right. So how are we going to do this? Well, the best first resource is who's in the field, who's got boots on the ground. Oh, that's the people at the hotels. Well, rather than working in parallel. How do we include them into what we're doing? And I don't think a lot of management companies have taken that perspective yet. They're still, we're going to hand them down their budget guidelines. We're going to hand them down the, the, the SOPs of what we want them to do. We're going to tell them their, their revenue goals. Guys, did you ever think about maybe including them into the conversation? You know, have them join. Yeah, and because because that's what they can do, can't do. Especially now where all those things that you just mentioned have gone to completely to crap because of COVID. Now right. they especially got to be in the conversation. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know what? The, the hotel I have in Austin and the one I have in Houston and the one I have in Dallas, they're all under the same regional guy who's going to try to roll out the same strategy for all three of those, even though all three of those markets are uniquely prepared to recover from this, you know, in different right. ways. But that's yeah, and, the guy, and the guy that's trying to roll out the, the generic version of it is like, hey, I'm only one person. I can only do so much. Great. Realize that you're, you're right. You, you've been asked to do more than what your original job was because the people that you had working with you are gone. So go to your next best resource. Go to each of those properties and go, guys, I'm not going to give you a vanilla wrap here. Tell me what we, you need, Houston. Tell me what you need, Austin. Tell me what you need, Dallas. Mm -hmm. Let's build what it is. But maybe if we collaborate, you might find out that Houston was doing some stuff Dallas should know about, vice versa, blah, 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 and create realistic. Because even as I'm dealing with budget dialogue, it's like, well, what do we care? It's going to get changed anyway. And I'm like, <laughs> this isn't just an exercise, guys. This is a this is a pattern of what you're going to be doing. And so, it, it, like I said, it's a matter of understanding the value of what you're doing in as much as just the, per the process of doing it. And I think we still have a lot of growing up to do because there's a lot of things that can be done better, obviously, from that process. And I, you know, I grew up in the in, outside of hospitality as well. Though I worked in hospitality for 20 years, I also did a lot. Of online retail clients. We had a lot of apparel companies and things like that. They, they do things completely different. Like it, it still bewilders me how separated we keep some of the functions of commercial activity. I mean, the, the fact that rates, marketing and sales are also siloed still is, it just doesn't, it baffles me in a lot of ways. And, and I'm hoping that, that, that COVID is an accelerator to change that. We are seeing more cheap commercial offices. We are seeing more collaboration through necessity, right, because of the, the, the lack of people. But we've got to get our arms around that, that these are all symbiotic. We've got to work together. You can't have marketing come up with a strategy and rate come up with a strategy and sales come up with a strategy and then tell operations what you're doing. It needs to be one machine with multiple calls. Yeah. Did anybody else, when and Stuart popped up, that he worked in the uh, the uh, the fabric or the garment industry, that he was a fashion model? Did anybody else just pop that thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I've seen him he did gloves and shoes, didn't he? Yes. yes. <laughs> the one the one concern I do have, and I know Mark brought it up in our earlier conversation with Citizen Ended with the corporate, and as innovative as that is, oh wait, no, 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 Ben brought it up. Ben brought it up, sorry. Uh, but where we we're talking with Mark at the time, where Citizen Ended brought up their corporate membership. Mm -hmm. And it is innovative because what you're really basically saying is it's not an L and R and it's not a negotiated, it's Anybody that feels that they have a reason to perpetually travel can create a unique relationship with us by signing up. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's good to that point. But I'm also worried, and this is one of the articles that uh, Robert shared in his list with us that we didn't get a chance to really pop on, was um, this membership versus ownership's perspective. Like, ownership's looking for cash flow. Mm -hmm. So... There, you know, there's this potential concern that membership or some relationship value that you pay for would be a means of cash flow for it. Unfortunately, they're also the same people that put resort fees in and so forth and anything else that they charge you for that you're already getting. So, you know, what I'm worried is that they're going to dilute the value of a paid relationship with you get a free bottle of water. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. If people are going to pay to have something unique with you, that value has to be amplified. It's not you just barely get what you paid for. It's because you're unique, because you paid for it, you're going to get much more value for it than that. And I'm worried that there's going to be a shortfall, that owners are going to shortchange that concept for short-term money. So like, oh, membership, loyalty, combination. <laughs> hey, Wait, Chris, no. maybe that's what happened when you got that free pair of underwear at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a, a, a service charge, a value add. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, guys. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, what, what happens with these scenarios where you've got people who are your, your lo who were your loyal customers? So uh, I used to work at Wyndham, so naturally I was a Wyndham Diamond member, right? Okay. So I would had a tendency, I would prefer to stay out of Wyndham brand property, okay? But now I haven't traveled. I haven't gone anywhere a year. Guess what? Come next year, I'm not a Diamond member anymore. So all of my tiered loyal customers haven't traveled, not of their own choice, just because we can, and they've lost status now. Come 2021, what's that do to your loyalty program? Well, it's, it's interesting you've got that because I know Virgin have just made a change. So um, Virgin, you, obviously Virgin are in all, all different kinds of um, uh, business sectors. Uh, one of the areas that they've got is a credit card. Um, if you were using the card, you get um, uh, Virgin Air Miles. They've just completely knocked that on the head. Um, it's now just Virgin Points, and they've they've just announced this week that you uh, that those points don't have an expiration date because they've realised that you know by having that expiration date on there, they're essentially forcing people into to traveling when they may not necessarily want to travel, where there may not be the ability to travel. Um, and the, it, it's obviously going to affect one of their, their leading areas. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about e-commerce here, uh, uh, credit card transactions, things like that. So they, they had to pivot. They've had to change their entire business model and the entire reason why they do it. And I think if, if, if other uh, of other businesses and other like you know airlines or, or hotels don't recognize this and see that this is actually a, an issue that we're all kind of stuck in you know especially the the potential uh, visitors to their, their property they're gonna have they're gonna there's there's a potentially that they're gonna lose customers based on that you know the, the whole loyalty programs all it all it takes is one person you know one business to turn and say well actually i can go and take all of those loyalty points I, you know, I'll come over to us. Come up, come over to us. Here's here's the loyalty environment. Even though, all right, it, you can't do anything about it now. But when it when when it does return, I, I will honour the points that you've got with a different hotel. You're going to pick up a lot of business there if the points, yeah. like you say, that Wyndham are going to lose out. It, it, it's and again, I know we've got the the, um, the the idea about collaboration, but I don't know. I think there's the, 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 there's a, there's an opportunity if if people don't wake up a bit. No, well, it's not just about the points, it's about the status. I, and I don't care who, whether it be Wyndham, Marriott, American Airlines, whatever it may be, there are perks to having status with those airlines and oh. hotel companies and so on. And if you haven't traveled and you're going to lose status in 2021, now it's all fair game, right? Yeah. Exactly. I, I would have gone to that brand or that airline because of my status and I don't have it anymore. So guess what? Open territory. Yeah. I think you're going to see more and more people do rollover status as an extension. Yeah. For that. They, I think they have to. They have to. Otherwise, yeah. it's a business. Yeah. It's the right thing to do. And if they don't, they're going to be screwed. So, yeah. yeah. Stuart's heard me say this before. I, I when people what we did a few years back, um, what we did was to incentivize them to return to the resort. It's just one resort. It wasn't like they could go to a bunch of places. Was we created a status level, three levels. And everybody that came was immediately given the second highest status level. First, the highest status level was really unattainable. You had to be there from, and it was very, very moderate threshold for them to come over. We basically looked at all of our CRM, saw people that came uh, for at least five days out of the year or three trips a year, or whatever it was, it was our base criteria to it. It's getting a little fuzzier as time goes by. But what we did was we reached out to them and said, congratulations, you're at our, I forget what we even called them now, silver level. And this allowed them certain things and certain, you know, expedience to this and this and this. And it was value proposition. It wasn't just made up stuff. There was a lot of value propositions to it, priorities for things and so forth, and, and, and a discount to the food and beverage and plus credit and all this other thing. And we did that for everybody that checked in because the value was to get them back, increase their frequency, or if anything, to acknowledge the frequency they already existed, but to make them feel unique compared to just, I picked the place to go to and I went there. That's one thing. The other is, is and, and this goes back to something earlier on that when we were talking about the big boxes in downtown, look, take a negative, make it a positive. Dean, to your point, you were one of those guys that made that level. Likelihood is, as time goes forward, you're going to start sliding back into that seat again and going off and doing things. So regardless of whether or not I have 100,000 hotels for you to visit with my membership program or not, I will acknowledge your, your, your priority and just simply say, if you were that level at that for whoever, whether you were Diamond with Marriott or Platinum with Hilton or whatever, you come in, you're VIP. Okay, 
You, this is your code. You're VIP. Even if I have one hotel, you're VIP. You know why? Because if I can get you to believe that I'm always going to take care of you when you come back to my market, you're going to come and stay with me because I'm always going to acknowledge the value that you are a traveler that reached those levels with other people. What's in it for me not to go over and give you the same value proposition with me, even if I'm only one hotel? Well, and several years ago, Virgin Hotels did something very similar to that, actually, where they would say that, number one, come over, we'll match your status. But not only that, as, as you sign up for our program, that first stay, we're going to give you actually just a taste of it, that top tier uh, service category or whatever they call their. So for that first day, you were a platinum diamond, whatever it might be, and you got a taste of it. And, oh, it was pretty cool, right? So now mm -hmm. you have to burn your way back to that. You know, it's, it's the drug dealer philosophy, right? I'm going to give you a taste of it, get you addicted to it, and get you coming back for more. Yep. We've said so it many times. Say, Dean said everyone needs to sell drugs to, to, to keep them busy. Yeah, I, mean, I thought that was the, I thought Tristan wrote a book about that, about how to get a wife. But I, I'm, I don't know. Maybe I'm confusing authors. Well, uh, speaking of wives, Ben has actually messaged me, um, and he has said um, he still got in trouble. He had to offer wine as reparation. So uh, that's okay. Uh, Wine, wine, it, wine, it smooths over all things. It, it, it's, yeah, it's a wine. I did something. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, I got to jump. I have a client opinion me, so I got to go. All uh, right, Stuart, uh, thank you for jumping in today. Uh, for those, okay, but I know you're coming up with another iteration of your survey. Uh, as soon as that comes up, obviously, uh, you know, please yeah. bring Melissa back. Yeah, I think um, this is going to be the final one for a little while. I think we're going to give it a little break. Let the, um, we kind of burned through our list pretty hard over the last 20 or so weeks. So this is issue, volume 10 of the pure hotel sentiment study. Um, some interesting stuff. Mm. Yeah, but we, yeah. we're going to take a little break. We're going to kind of take the time to really look at this longitudinal study and say, what have we learned? You know, mm -hmm. we're spitting out data so much, and there's a lot of insight that we haven't really been able to unpack yet. So how can we really leverage this data and help the industry? So I think that's the next phase of it. But it should be. It should hit our blog, fueltravel.com slash blog uh, by Wednesday of next week. So hopefully, the show next well, week. Anybody we'll to jump to conclusions on uh, thin line uh, data? I'm, I'm your guy. I mean, I can look at something <laughs> and give an opinion. So, uh, you know, I'm good. <laughs> uh, and I will say, so we we, we talked about the the podcast, fueltravel.com slash podcast. We're recording an episode this week on the um, cookieless world, but then next week we're going to do a um, we've never done this on the show before. We're all going to watch the the new documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And it, it kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier. We're all going to watch that. And then we're going to have a, an episode where we kind of comment on that show. So anyone that's interested, go Is watch the Mystery show. Science Theater 3000, where you go and just yeah. watch the so, movie and talk. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be a director's commentary, but we're not the directors. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's awesome. It sounds, so, it sounds a bit like Stuart. It's going to be like the fan zone. Uh, I don't know whether I think I think you, you have it over in yeah, 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 yeah. America, but basically, you know, just watching the spots and listening to the fans commentate on that. It's hilarious. It's great mm -hmm. to watch. I get the feeling it's going to be the same for you guys. It is, and I, I might accidentally think I was supposed to watch a Star Wars movie and comment on that as much as I do the social dilemma. So we'll. we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, awesome. That's coming in the next couple of weeks. But we got 163 episodes of the podcast you can download. We've been talking a lot about how to recover from COVID. So fueltravel.com slash podcast or just search for Hotel Marketing Podcast. You'll see it anywhere you, you get podcasts. And then if you want software, we've got some killer solutions for online booking. If you're worried about cross-domain tracking, you don't have to with our booking engine. It embeds right within the URL of your website. It's really cool. So none of that that nonsense you have to deal with yeah. um we have a crm which is getting a lot of traction right now a lot of people are realizing that you've got to double down on your owned assets and emailing to your database is the way to do it mm -hmm. SCRM, we had a customer this week has a database of a little little under hundred thousand email addresses of guest history they sent out one message promoting next year's stays at a good discount they made over a hundred thousand dollars from one email that they sent out so that's that's a dollar an email. It, yeah, and, and that's for 2021 rates, right? So really good. CRM is, is the way to, to market your way through this. And then we also have a mobile app. So if you're worried about contacting, contact between your staff and the guests or just efficiency or lack of staff and you can't check as many people in as you used to, 
mobile app is a great solution. We have all that at fueltravel.com. So that's for sure. Thanks, Thank you, guys. For your time. Thanks for everything as Enjoy usual. The show. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Good day, mate. Oh, my God. And then there were three. And then there were three. Yeah, no women today. What? I mean, I, I, I think you all saw the response. All the, all, they just dropped off. Like, uh, oh, wow. There's not there's, there's not the balanced community that we normally have. Of, you of mean what we have. the voice of reason, I think, is what we're yes. saying. Oh, yeah, of, of, of intelligent uh, dialogue, yes, instead of random uh, contestant <laughs> opinions. <laughs> it reminds me of my senior year at prom. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, oh, good golly. So a couple of, I guess a couple of things, Tris, I, I don't really get, you know, first off, great to have you back on the show. I mean, for a couple of weeks, I know you've been crazy busy and everything. Yeah. Um, a little bit since we have the time, and I don't really want to just jump into another topic or anything like this. It's great that we get the chance to kind of like wrap up a little bit of what everything everybody's doing right now, because we are in a transitional point. I mean, just from a hospitality instrument, we're in budget season anyway, and there's just been this whole dialogue of how do you do this? I mean, I'm a proponent of zero option budgeting and all this stuff, but from a three and six perspective, how what are you guys focusing on doing? What kind of you know what what, what kind of uh, client engagements are you having? Not by client name, but just yeah, what are sure. some of the things that you're facing with and dealing with? It's it, it's it's a real mixed bag. Um, it, it it really is. We've got. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, we're we're we're, we're pushing uh, Meta Search along with Dean uh, quite heavily because it's it's a really useful channel right now, um, especially you know with uh, some of the smaller hotels that are really really panicking. I mean, you know, we're working with hotels over in the United States. We're working with hotels in the UK. We're working with hotels in Europe. Uh, we're just seeing so many different variations right now. Uh, I mean, like, we had some hotels in, in the UK that were going great, absolutely fantastic. We were getting, you know, like 20, 25 to one return on ad spend um, from Google Ads. Uh, and so, say again, sorry? Last click? Um, yeah, well, Google, Google Ads, yeah, last, last yeah. click attribution model, yeah. Google, Google Ads. I, I knew the answer, but I wanted to emphasize yeah, yeah, that. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no view through. This This is purely search, so there's, there's yeah. no there's no impression or anything else like that. Um, and, and and especially the, the one that we were, uh, the, the one that, that was getting such good uh, re, uh, results, they were, um, they never really pushed into digital marketing. But what we're finding is there's people who are, are struggling now, that they're now thinking, oh, I really need to do something. And so, that's where we've kind of stepped in. But with the local restrictions and lockdowns that have been happening around the UK, they just got like a hundred hundred thousand pounds worth of cancellations just like that. <laughs> and it's all of that hard work. And now now the conversations that we're having is no, no, stay the line. Don't mm -hmm. don't just panic and, and don't make a knee jerk reaction. You've got to think long term here. You you've got to you've got to believe that you're actually going to be you, you, you Essentially, as I say, you've got to be in it to win it. If you're mm. not switched on right now, I mean, the amount of thousands of, of, of pounds and dollars worth of savings we made by uh, by getting bookings, by going direct at that return of that spend versus letting the OTAs just pick up that business was, was huge. Uh, and I think that's the way that we've been trying to uh, focus on it now is, is the cost saving of actually doing this as opposed to just arbitrarily letting the OTAs take the business. Um, mm -hmm. And budget season as well is a big thing. So we've got lot, lots of lots of discussions, lots. And again, it's so so very very difficult, isn't it? Because we, we're facing the same um, the same dilemmas that you mentioned there. You know, people saying, "Well, what's the point in doing this? Because it's going to be it's going to be different next week, let alone next year." Um, and and I totally understand that um, point of view because you kind of think it yourself. You know, is this just an exercise in futility? But no, right. we, we need we need to have some kind of plan in place because. The only thing that's probably going to change in that is the amount of money. The plan itself, you still need to have a digital marketing plan in place. Mm -hmm. It may be that the plan needs to be very flexible and very, you know, very diverse that we can pivot on a six months if needs be, you know, because if we end up having 30% of the budget that we originally thought of, or we actually get the 100% of the budget, we need to be able to, to have something in place. So for me right now, the, the way we've been approaching budget season has been, probably much more in depth than we've ever done in the past. You know, last year when we were doing it, it's like, all right, we roughly know your budget's gonna be X thousands of dollars a month. This is what we're gonna do. And it probably works out, you know, a bit of variation as some new new and funky things come out by Google or Facebook or whatever. 
but as we as we're getting into um uh, into the, the next year it's kind of going to be stable whereas now really got to be flexible where you know right. it's, it, you know you, you you're contingency planning almost from a uh, from a budget point of view yeah we, we've done the same in the sense that it's not the diversity of the channels it's the prioritization of the channels based on contribution and if we have a varying amount of money that we can spend mm. knowing where we would spend it based on what level like okay we're 30 percent, as you said of our budget that we had originally considered having where does that 30 percent go it goes to the okay. highest producing producing channels of opportunity what are those channels so we have a exactly. we have a forced ranking scale of the channels or opportunities and then we have according to the the amount of water so to speak which glass yeah. gets filled first and and then it's hard to explain that to a client perspective because they're so used to static p l based what's our percentage cost per department department based on categorization categorization based on itemization and and it's like no we're the marketing has to be a little bit of fluid because if you're not having the cash flow at the top you really have no designation of where you're spending it if there's just nothing to spend so having it prioritized within your departmental cost is not there you have to realize your departmental cost is completely based on high-end cash flow. What comes in determines what gets filled first. You know, like you see on social, you know, if you pour the water here, which cup gets filled first? You know, you're yeah. almost like that, where it's like, look, which one Which one is it that you need to do? Well, you need to refuel, you refuel the engine, okay, before you worry about drinking it. You know, you got to make sure you put back into it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so that you're, it, it, you're, you're right. It, it is completely linked, and it, 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 it's it's really interesting to see that the whole the approach um, for for the hospitality industry. I mean, I've I've long subscribed to the to the fact that the approach that the hospitality industry takes to um, uh, to direct marketing is is too rigid. It's incorrect. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a lot more flexible. Almost see. And I hate seeing this, but almost see that your direct channel as being another OTA, because you wouldn't you wouldn't put a cap on an OTA in terms of how much business that they would that, you know that, that that they would bring in if they're bringing if they're filling up your hotel, you, you you'd never really put a huge amount of cap on it. Yet they'll put a cap on probably one of the cheapest areas to get that business in the first mm -hmm. place. And I've never understood that it should be. Hey, look, you know we're getting a you know a, a ten to one return on spend, a twelve and fifteen to one. Whatever it may be, you know, for me, there should there shouldn't be a there shouldn't be a cutoff for your budget. If you're going great guns, keep throwing money at it because this is business sense. You look at e-commerce world, and the hotel industry is an e-commerce industry, whether whether we like it or not. You look at the, you look at e-commerce world uh, out there; they will not put a cap on your budget. If you're mm -hmm. bringing, you know, as quick as I can make something and sell it out there, if you can get me more sales, I go. I'm going to make more things. And we're selling it online in, in an e-commerce point of view but the hospitality world i don't know that it's big again it goes back to that compartmentalization that that silo aspect of sales marketing and revenue management all being the uh, budget volleyball game whose budget is it exactly mm -hmm. exactly indeed i had some success with an older owner uh yeah. when i was trying to discuss this uh i said would you rather worry if you had your last dollar to spend that the the lit billboard 25 miles up the road stayed lit or the light that's sitting on your building stay lit. Hmm. And he's like, well, I want the sign on my building to stay lit so when they see me, they can pull in. I'm like, exactly what direct marketing is compared to paying somebody else. Yeah. Okay, you're, you're, you're making sure people can find you. That's what you're doing. Keeping the billboard up the road, sure, it's valuable. I'm not saying it's not, but if you had your last dollar and you can only spend it on one, it's better to have the billboard lit that they drive in. It's a dark building and you're going, oh, maybe I shouldn't have, you know, or is it that, Maybe they didn't see the billboard, but they're looking and they see you and yeah. they come to you. So that even goes down to the SEO level. Like, Those what are you doing brand what brand you brand need brand to do brand. to show up for yourself? You know, even if you don't have a dollar to spend to pay for somebody to see you, are you still doing what you need to, to show up for yourself for that? But uh, yeah, and, and again, it's, it, it is, it's just a, a, a mind shift. It, it, it really is. And, and I think in, in, in future years, um, I don't think we're going to have as much of a problem with this because I believe that uh, to be a revenue manager now, you actually have to be a digital marketer and a salesperson all wrapped up in one. Oh yeah, you've yeah. got to, you've got to understand that. You, the, gone are the days of just being a revenue manager and and that's all the, all that you deal with, you know. Um, and you look at the the younger generations that are coming through; they're growing up with 
so many different sources, so many different platforms now that, I mean, I look at my kids, uh, my kids are uh, nine and, and 13. They don't watch television. You know, they, they don't watch television. They, they watch, they watch a portable device. It's, you know, an iPad mm -hmm. or whatever it's going to be. And they're not watching mainstream channels. They're not watching, mm -hmm. you know, they're watching YouTube. Yeah. They're watching, mm -hmm. You know, they're watching a totally different, my 13 year old daughter, you know, uh, on TikTok, as with all of, all of her friends, it's just, I mean, that's a different matter. Trying to speak to a 13 year old girl at the moment without waving her arms at you is really difficult. <laughs> you but you know what? I, I, I was just talking to UNT, uh, their hospitality uh, class, and I do it every year for Dr. Lee. And um, there was uh, eight people in the class. And, you know, what do you talk to them about? Here they've picked a profession or an industry that has, is literally laying people off and letting people go. People that have experience, people that have been doing things. And they're sitting there, you're looking, going, did I back the wrong horse? And I'm trying to tell them, it's like, please understand. You look at the price side of this, and you may not think there is one. You are learning what 80% of the current management in our industry didn't know up until this COVID, and that was how to handle downturn. Mm -hmm. You're living yeah. through a time. The skills that you're learning by learning what you are right now is going to make you so much better in the future when whatever is the next thing that impacts our industry negatively after we rebound or do whatever we do, okay? You have a skill set. You have a toolkit that says, I remember learning about, or I was in that time when, because right now, all the people that lived through 9-11, that lived through 08, even as far back as 95 and all the rest of it, we're drawing on, I remember the day, yeah, nobody was walking to my door, you know, I had to go, you know, I wind up the fax machine, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, <laughs> but you're learning a skill set that everybody else painfully hasn't. The people that aren't working right now are impacted because of the people who didn't know what to do about this or couldn't do anything about this justifiably. And they're out and having to relearn a new skill because they always lived in an uptick economy. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's interesting to say that because I saw something on LinkedIn. I think it was today. Um, and I forget who posted it, but it was a really good, a really interesting post. It's, it's like, however many trillions of dollars have been lost due to, um, uh, you know, uh, external influences, disasters, you know, as you mentioned, 9-11, this and the other. Uh, and it highlighted all of them and, and rolled it up as a total number. It was a, an eye-wateringly big number. There were so many zeros, I won't, I won't even know where to start. But it said 21% of that revenue or business that was lost or affected by the town, downturn has happened in the last three years. So, what, what, you know, what, we're living in a time that's really, really difficult. I mean, because we just had the financial crisis. We, you, you've, you've, we've now got this. It's a really tough time. But it, once we come out the back of this, and we will come out the back of this, mm -hmm. this you're absolutely right. The skill sets that you learn are 100%. They're, they're going to be invaluable. Maybe we're going to be a little bit cautious. Maybe, yeah. may, maybe you might find that there's going to be large companies out there that are built on solid foundations as opposed to, hopes and sticky back plastic you know it's mm -hmm. like it, well, look, even something locally here the the, the the car rental company hertz is based down by where i live here mm -hmm. and the the employees had to actually petition the court to stop the the uh the current way that they were handling bankruptcy because the executives that drove them into bankruptcy were getting 51 million dollars worth of bonuses well, there you okay go. guys you know, maybe we have to take it a whole valuation. The CEO is getting paid thousands of times more than the, the most common employee gets paid for their same company. You know, in the United States is, is a huge thing. Like we have to be a little bit more fiscally related to the people that run it versus the people that are doing the work. Who knows what might come out of us? What I'm really saying is that there's yeah, such a variety right. of things. Well, that, this that, might be that, that CEO pay gap has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's been accelerating because the times have been more prosperous. Right. It'd be interesting to see how much it decelerates. It, it, mm -hmm. it will be very interesting to see. But I think, sorry, one last thing. Uh, we've, we've, been, we've been playing. Uh, we've been we're, we're playing a long game at three and six. That's that's what we decided to, we decided to do. Um, obviously, yeah, everything that everyone's saying, you know, helping out our, our clients, doing what we can, you know, um, char charging where where we we can charge where it's realistic to charge or or reasonable right. to charge or, or or just helping out wherever we can but the long game that we're doing is we're, we're looking at this now because there's the the, the landscape of the hospitality industry has, has changed forever the, there's no two ways about it. hotels that that existed may not exist in 2021 2022 no they, they, may, they may not they, they they may you know sadly that may be the case but they also goes for the same for 
um, uh, hospitality tech companies, hospitality service companies, uh, you know, all of the feeder markets that, uh, that go into the hotel mm -hmm. industry, that that's that's all going to change. So we're 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 backing ourselves. So right now we're building out our our digital marketing portfolio, our software portfolio, because we you know we want to look at it, um, it from a tech point of view as well as a service point of view. And we're looking at 2022, 2023. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's mm -hmm. where we're we're aiming. That's that's where things are going to you know ultimately come good for us and our clients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at a scale level. Obviously, mm -hmm. someone wants to speak to us now, but yeah, we can happily show it because we've got some really cool things that we're we're, uh, we're 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 currently working on in the hidden dark depths mm -hmm. of our of our development rooms right now. Yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> and I'm here you, to, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know the one. When we've got, I've got a developer in the room over there. There's no windows in there. I just throw him a pizza every now and again. Just you know, every once in a while, just some food into the dark room. <laughs> Dean, Dean, what, 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 you know, I know you're doing two angles at the same time. A little bit of what, what's that catching up with you real quick. Yeah, well, actually, interestingly enough, we were just talking about the whole budget thing, actually. I, I did a webinar series with Epic Revenue Consultants. We just released the second installment of that. You'll see it on LinkedIn. Uh, you, you can look me up on LinkedIn or look them up and you'll find that. And it talked about budgets. And one of the things that we talked about was the fact that, look, if, if you're, <laughs> just like what Tris was saying, if you're hitting a 10, 12, 15 to 1 return on your ad spend, uh, or let's talk about it as a cost of sale because that's a better apples to apples. So if you've got a 12% uh, cost of sale coming off of Meta and you had a 15% cost of sale coming off of your OTAs, why would you ever shut off your Meta and decide, no, instead I'd rather take that from the OTA at an extra 3%. Uh, that just philosophically doesn't make sense. Now that's philosophical. Reality is we have marketing budgets, right? And so we talk a little bit about how to deal with those marketing budgets. Uh, but the whole point of Basecamp Meta was really uh, to provide that educational resource, because when we talk about the industry right now, and we we talked about this earlier, right? A lot of people have to be cross trained. Uh, that revenue manager didn't have to do digital marketing before. Guess what? <laughs> now all of a sudden you do, right? So how do they do that digital marketing? At least the meta search part of it. Or you have a digital agency that has spent years doing search engine marketing. They're really good at that, and now their client came to them and said, "Yeah, we fired all our people. I need you to do our meta for us." And they're going, uh, yeah, we can do that. Can we, right? Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're doing it with Basecamp Meta is to provide that resource to help, uh, whether it be hoteliers or digital agencies to understand how to work with MetaSearch. And uh, we're putting together a paid series of webinars, but we can also do the consulting, the training and so forth to help you with that. The other side is on our metasearchmarketing.com where you know, there, there's a lot of really good agencies out there right now that, that do do meta search. Uh, the vendors like Cody and Derbysoft and Whip and on down the line. And by no means are we trying to compete with any of them because they're really good at what they do. And I'd be silly to attempt to to be their competition, but instead to help you as a hotel understand what is the right technology fit for me based upon my individual needs and what I'm trying to do. Who is the best one? And with a very platform agnostic approach to that. Uh, but then as I was putting that together, I also realized there was a huge gap. And that is that if I'm trying to help that uh, 10 room bed and breakfast or boutique hotel and small independence, it is really hard to find that technology match for them. And so I really wanted to identify what is their opportunity? How do we get that little bed and breakfast connected into just Google? I'm just talking about Google here because they're the big dog in the room when we talk about Meta. Uh, if I was talking to a big resort hotel, I'd talk about cross-channel optimization, all of the other channels they ought to be in and so forth. But for that small little property, I want to talk about getting you live in Google and finding a way to do that at a price point that's not going to break the bank because actually doing it is not hard if I am willing to pay $600 a month for it. Yeah, I can find you a way to do that. Uh, but that's not practical, right? <laughs> You've got, I have 10 rooms in your property. So finding a way to do that in a manner that is practical and that could be done with little to no integration because, oh, by the way, you may not have an integratable system. Your booking engine may not be integratable. How do we deal with that? Figure it out a solution. Uh, so I won't go down that rabbit hole right now, but reach out to us. We can tell you more. Awesome. Uh, two, two announcements. Uh, Tris, I don't know whether Ben shared this with you. Dean already knows this. Starting October 1st, I am launching our membership program. Yes, he did mention. Yes, looking okay, forward okay. So, uh, and you all have been uh, voluntold. Uh, you're <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll have quality product, let's just say, on the membership side of things. There we go. 
know all the details of it, you can go to the website right now. It's just a splash page with a sign up for when we actually launch it. And that's at hospitalitymarketing.club. It's a, uh, what I call petty cash membership, uh, where you, for a small amount of fee right now, we're going to be offering uh, that you buy the first month and the rest of the year is free. It's a chance to try to build up our audience and to get, uh, show the value proposition and get the, the, uh, uh, the advocates and all that. Plus, we're also going to be doing a summit, which you guys are going to be hitting up with as to uh, at the beginning of December, we're going to be doing the, the uh, quarterly summit. And the first one is the Hospitality Marketing Summit, uh, fourth quarter 2020, which will be December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, two hours a day. Uh, Meta Search is going to be one of the topics, and how to take over the world will be another one, which I'm sure Tris will be taking care of. Uh, <laughs> one million dollars. Um, that's, that's the, uh, the signing on fee, isn't it? Yeah, one million. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for that, also well, next week we are having another guest co-host. Actually, it's guest co-host with uh, an entourage, and it's from the Russell Research Group. Russell Group, um, uh, what is it? The Russell Partnership. They're the ones that do all of the uh, simulation training uh, for uh, how to operate uh, for P and Ls for hotels and so forth. So it's going to be kind of a, a math esque kind of thing. They're launching a new product which I, I was privileged to help them with. And I thought it was such a cool thing. I said, hey, you guys got to come on the show because it, it actually helps companies build a forecast profit P&L thing in 10 minutes for the next two years, which we're talking about budgets and so forth. Literally, it creates a very dynamic, you put this stuff in and it begins to tell you what your margins of opportunity are for things and helps you tackle the budget stuff. But what I really thought was really cool about it is that, okay, you did it once and then tomorrow the world has changed. You can go back and do the change over. Like, okay, once you're accessing this. You know, so I thought it'd be really fun to talk to the creators of it and say, what was in your head about this? How did you figure this out to do this in a way that could really be flexible for people and to use it and work with it and stuff. So Peter Russell will be with us along with a couple others, um, uh, some notables in the industry. Uh, I'll let them surprise us with that when we come next week, but that's going to be our guest host for next week. And strangely enough, we have become so popular because of you guys being on it, uh, you know, that we have guest host requests and a line right now. We, we will probably have guest host row for most of October. Uh, Tris, you're just a sexy beast and people want to hang. So no, that's, that's really not it. I think they're, they're going to stop now. That's it. They'll be going. <laughs> <Weird. laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's the beard. Yeah, it's it's the beard for you. Yeah, and everything. Yeah, no, you're looking good, dude. You're looking good. <laughs> Wife's a lucky woman. Woman, lucky woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure yeah, she is when she forgives me for the whole birthday thing. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's it. taking another year. In soon. Um, but <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll just hang over your head for the until next year. It really, yeah, yeah. you know, that, yeah. It'll be the thing that when you think you're almost winning a conversation, no, no. Oh, no. Never. Birthday come out. <laughs> I will never ever win that any conversation for that matter. No, I was going to say, but there's never a conversation I have won. I may have walked away thinking I made a point, but it's still stung. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I was right, but why do I feel like I'm wrong? I just feel like yeah, that hurt. Um, okay, so with that, thank you, uh, and then for all those that joined us earlier, that had to depart earlier, Mark uh, Lee, thank you so much for joining us earlier. Uh, fascinating to hear Aaron on the insights. And, and as always, as we said before, you're always welcome to come join the uh, the cadre of fun conversations. Yes, sir. So, Aaron, where where can they find you if they want to get in contact with your good self? <sighs> Gee golly. Well, well, first off, we'll be hospitality digital market digital marketing.com forward slash live. There you can find this and all previous episodes. You can also find hospitality digital marketing.com forward slash podcasts, which I keep hitting you both up for creating your own mm -hmm. uh, to do. Just a reminder, nothing like <laughs> that, just in the knife. Uh, but with that being said, both of those are there. Also, as a reminder, there is the Hospitality Revenue Management Podcast done by Lily Markman, who was not able to join us today. Uh, also, the Hospitality Sales Podcast, which Holly Zoba does, also unable to join us today. Uh, Tim Peter has his amazing podcast. It really is a phenomenal podcast. And that's Things Out Loud, and that's at Tim Peter and Associates. Um, and he had mentioned that he was going to be gone for a few weeks. He has a new client engagement that's ramping up and time suck for that. Um, again, Stewart's podcast for fuel travel, which is phenomenal. Really, truly one of the best. I mean, it is award winning, literally. There you uh, go. Yeah. And he does tackle great topics. I think this next one, I'm just waiting dire to hear how they yeah. break that down. because it's a, it's a very relevant thing right now. And they're so timely yeah. with that. Yeah, plus their survey and so forth is phenomenal. You can catch it at their blog. That's fueltravel.com slash blog or fueltravel.com slash podcast. Both of them for that. 
Ed with fuel, uh, Flip 2, which we didn't really get to point too fast at. Um, did I miss anybody else in the cast of characters that we had? You and Ben. So real quick, Tris, 3 and 6, where to find you? I mean, I threw the link in for your yeah, LinkedIn. But yeah, LinkedIn yeah. And, and, uh, 3 and 6, or you can get me direct at uh, tris.hayward at uh, 3 and 6 dot agency, uh, or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's tristan.hayward. And I know, Dean, you have a new spiffy video that's coming out soon, just yeah. saying. But uh, <laughs> other than that, what web uh, web addresses and emails can they use to get in hold of you? Bet. So uh, basecampmeta.com, metasearchmarketing.com, just because I love the domain. And uh, look me up on LinkedIn under Dean Schmidt. That's S-D-H-M-I-T, one T, no D. And for all those that didn't get a chance to join us today, we missed you, but next week's always next week. So until 1130 Eastern U.S. time, uh, I know it's a little tough for the English side. And Trista, again, thanks to your wife for letting you uh, <laughs> hang with us and uh, tell Ben, you know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we will see everyone next week, 1130 Eastern U.S. time a.m. Until then, uh, we look forward to and hope that you stay safe and healthy until then. So bye, everybody. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura.